If you can remain standing, we'll, we'll go straight to the karakia, which we can say together. Whakataka te hao ki te uru, whakataka te hao ki te tonga. Ki e mā kine kine ki te tata, ki e mā tara tara ki tai. Aki ana te atakura, he teo, he hoka, he hauhu, ti he mauri ora. Well done. Thank you, councillors. I declare the meeting open and look, welcome everyone to uh, to this meeting. Um, it's interesting as we change the, the way in which meetings occur in these wonderful COVID times that we've got now, we've got slightly more people in the room. We're masking, unmasking. I think we're still trying to work our way through that. But anyway, welcome, to, especially those of you who are here as guests, because we haven't actually had, if you like, guests for some time uh, in this meeting room. So, um, so it's, it's nice to see you here. Uh, councillors, if you can please let myself or the Democracy Service, uh, Democracy Advisor know if you intend to leave the meeting at any stage. Uh, morning tea is going to be at 10.30 now. I'm going to take an extended morning tea. Uh, we've got, um, I want to talk, spend a little bit of time for those councillors, I have already mentioned it, to just to talk through the um, appointments process for the, um, the hearings uh, committees uh, and the, the structure of those. Uh, lunch will be at 12 or 12.30. I'm hoping that we might have finished by that stage. Um, uh, and, if, when, and when we do, we, we have a, a special Christmas, uh, Christmas lunch. Um, apologies. I've got apologies from uh, the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Paul for early departure. Although I see Councillor Paul's... Online. Online. Oh, she's online. Right, OK. Right, cool. OK. Right, so I'll move those. So seconded by Councillor Pannett. Thank you. If you can vote, please. Thank you. Uh, now, have we got the... Oh, We're going to go to the blessing. Yes, oh, we do, right there, right. It's in the right order, right. OK, look, I, I would like to welcome... Um, we were originally going to have Rabbi Ariel, uh, Rabbi Ariel here. Um, he has been delayed. In fact, we've had a couple of people who are involved in today's proceedings who have been delayed by various plane flights not being able to get in. Uh, so uh, Manjik um, and uh, David are going to be here, Manjik Graywell and David uh, Schwartz from the Interfaith uh, Council. Uh, so welcome. It's lovely to have you here. Lovely to have you in person. Um, and uh, thank you for blessing our... Meeting. Oh, sorry, David. Can you go to the lectern? Is apparently is the process. Yes. Yep. Manjit, I think Manjit, I think we're required still to have masks here. This is the the joyous thing which we're working through. Right. As I said, we're still, we're still working our way through some of these processes. Tēnā koutou, katoa, shalom and good morning. Before the last council meeting for this year, I bring you thanks on behalf of the Wellington Interfaith Council for your assistance and cooperation during the year. It has been a strange and difficult year for all of us with our lives turned upside down by the COVID pandemic and many routines displaced. One is the absence of a traditional Christmas time performance of Handel's Messiah by the much loved Orpheus Choir. So I will offer a tiny snatch of the famous aria, Why do our councillors so furiously rage together? <laughs> Be that as it may, the Wellington Interfaith Council brings good wishes to all councillors and council employees for a happy and restful holiday season, refreshment for the year to come, and offers this short prayer. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Bless our leaders with dedication and foresight, fortitude and imagination to solve the complex issues that we envisage in our future. May they lead us to a time when neighbours embrace and the communities thrive, a time when liberty and well-being encompass us all. Amen.
Uh, thank you very much, David. And for those of you who don't know, David, of course, was uh, once one of those councillors who furiously raged around this table. <laughs> Although I don't, remember, I don't remember David doing a lot of furious raging. So, David, thank you, and uh, Manjit. So, th th blessings to all of you for, uh, for Christmas. Um, councillors, I've, I've given a few of you a heads up, just those who were here earlier, um, that I'm going to say a few words in taking the, the mayoral announcement um, and uh, to reflect a little bit on this year. And my wonderful team um, have done a magnificent job in putting together a few slides from this year, so just bear with me. This is the first time that I'll have gone through this. It's intended to be used for uh, a number of different purposes. But can I just start by saying, councillors uh, and officers, um, thank you very much. We, I think we started in a fairly challenging place uh, at the beginning of the year. I think we end in a very good place. Uh, and I think we can also reflect on that we've achieved an enormous amount. I know most of you reflected of saying, crikey, we're busy. Officers have reflected the same. The community has reflected the same as well, both in terms of the number of submissions that people have, or the number of issues people have had to respond to in terms of making submissions. And re you will all recall our, um, our advisory groups all coming to us and saying, gosh, we were really busy too, because you were busy. And we've been busy because we've been getting stuff done for our city. So thank you all for a, what's been a very productive, um, a very productive 12 months. Uh, and I, in, in advance, I'm going to wish you all a, a very, very happy, safe, restful, and reinvigorating Christmas. Because uh, next year is going to be quite busy as well. Uh, we know that, and one of the papers we've got today is reflecting uh, on that as well. So right, let's start off with. Uh, the year has been a year with many challenges. Uh, of course, we've, the other part of this, of course, is we've been doing all this busy mahi at a time when there's a global pandemic. And we thought, you know, we forget end of 2020, there was this thought of bring on 2021 because it's going to be different. Well, it kind of was only different, same. Um, more challenges. And, and we're going to see some more challenges, I'm sure, in 2022 um, as we open up to the rest of New Zealand and then the rest of the world. Um, so, next one. But despite, despite these uh, constraints, uh, we have managed to hold a fantastic events program. Obviously, we lost some, particularly at the end of the year. But I think we still say that we have held the world's biggest street parties in Cuba Dupa and Newtown Festival. And people have enjoyed a really fantastic events program uh, in our city. We were also uh, fortunate, certainly I, I consider us fortunate, to have hosted the biggest uh, A-League game uh, out of the finals in the in the entire season, the one the one game we got the Phoenix back, uh, so that was fantastic. Great atmosphere there, and I've got to say, well done to the team last night on winning a uh, last 16 round a round of last 16 in the FFA Cup. Events had to keep on changing and pivoting. This is downtown shakedown at Waitangi Park, and of course that was an extra event, um, essentially because originally we were, have homegrown, and this was sort of like the the makeup for homegrown, but a very spectacularly successful event. Uh, at Waitangi Park. Safety in the central city became a major issue in 2021 and we moved with speed to address these concerns. Uh, we of course have Paniki Promise, which is a partnership with a whole range of different um, other organisations. Everybody is doing their part. We're adding more organisations. In fact, we just reached out to Victoria University. DCM has just come on board as well. Uh, and we've already made some significant changes in terms of lighting. CCTV cameras have been upgraded uh, and the, the, the work there upgraded. Uh, we've opened Te Wahi Afina. We've consulted on the opening of a youth hub uh, and there's a community hub to come as well. So we're looking forward to those, to moving the toilets and to refreshing Tiara Park. So a lot of great work being done by a lot of people led by the council there. Next one. Uh, pandemic brought financial hardship to many. Uh, this is obviously uh, supermarkets and you know, vacant shelves and all those sort of things. But what I did want to reflect on is the fantastic work which has been done by the council here as part of our response in lockdown. Council supported by many community welfare agencies across the city provided almost 16 tonnes of food to 59 groups. That's almost 46,000 meals. And I actually had a lovely call this morning from Gary Sutton from the Soup Kitchen uh, to thank us for uh, collectively for the work we're doing, to say actually we're looking miles better than we did before, and to say keep it up and thank you for your support. So I thought I'd reflect that to you. You said I could, so I am. Next one. Housing is a real issue uh, in the city, uh, and this year we also opened the first of our te kainga, um, uh, accommodation units and we've got uh, over the next year we're expecting to be up to about 400 uh, dwellings and then over the next five years we've targeted a thousand dwellings. So these are, are really great new, they are genuinely new accommodation spaces for our people. 
We're an inclusive, vibrant city, and uh, some of us uh, were up there uh, when we turned the lights on for Light Up Your Lives to say, actually, we stand behind. In this case, it was our transgender community. We've had our, um, our Interfaith Council uh, speaking to us today as well. This is about us saying that we're a place where everybody belongs and everybody should uh, be able to stand and be who they want to be. Next one. We're also making tracks on some big development programs. So I think you will all recognise this one. And this is not merely a new building now. It is confirmed as the home of the School of Music, which is a fantastic collaboration between Victoria University, the NZSO, and will bring real life. I think the, the future for Tanaka Civic Square is really, really exciting. And speaking of such, uh, Sarah and I had the privilege of going again to have a, a wee look at part of the town hall and the work that's being done there the other day. Uh, and you can see there, there's just a forest of uh, scaffolding in some places and, uh, and reinforcing in others. So a huge amount of work being done. It's a great, again a great piece of work with Naila Love, our project management team, a lot of subcontractors, a lot of innovation and creativity. It is going well and we're really looking forward to having the town hall back uh, in a couple of years' time. Other buildings coming back as well. The St James Theatre, uh, another tricky project, discovering things we weren't expected behind the walls. COVID interruptions again there, but we are looking forward to opening the St James in May of next year. And by crikey, we better hit that timetable. We're also investing in the city's uh, core infrastructure. Here, this is the, the big new rising main, which will provide extra resilience, which uh, up Whitmore and Bowen Streets. Uh, and it's interesting when you look below the surface how complicated some of these things are. And it was interesting in particular, I might say, some people say well, we, should, we should pull up the old tracks to, to lay those tracks, you know, the trams used to run on. The tracks in this case are a good, I'm going to say 18 inches, two feet, you know, in, in the old uh, terms, below the surface. So good luck ever getting those up out of, <laughs> out of the ground. But complicated work and Wellington Water and contractors doing a fantastic job there. Next one. And likewise, the, the great work which was done, I'm going to particularly reflect on the work which was done on Jervois Quay. So something which could have taken a long, long time, caused a lot of disruption, well planned, and in a weekend, in fact they did it 24 hours early, um, they got the main chunk of that work done so that uh, traffic and people were again able to move through that area. So Wellington Water again doing a great job. And here's another shout out to Wellington Water. The, the progress in Omororo, again, that is going very well and looking forward to going up and seeing that shortly the biggest reservoir that the city has ever built. Next one. And we're not stopping there with infrastructure. So obviously we've just finished the consultation, or at least the submissions have just come in, uh, for the three things, tying transport and urban development together. Let's get Wellington moving. Draft district plan and Panaki Ponaki, the cycle network uh, plan, which is about us being a, a city with the housing we need, the transport we need to be more sustainable. So the first one of those is obviously let's get Wellington moving. It's really great to finally put some real plans on the on you know in front of people to put some pictures in front of people of what they're going to look like and the interesting thing is as far as I can see the biggest feedback we've got is can you do it faster so we're working on that our new district plan of course and uh, we will be looking forward to hearing submissions on that as the next step before we do a statutory uh, district plan to provide for the extra housing to provide for the extra non-residential activity and to provide for protecting the values that we are the things that we value in our city next one and our bike network plan, the 147 kilometres of cycleways. This is the, the, the big picture cycleway plan uh, that we are also been engaging on. Next one. Now, our harbour is the perfect place to celebrate Matariki. Next one. And just some of the beautiful um, sights and sounds of celebrating uh, Matariki, lighting up our waterfront and drawing crowds down to the waterfront. And I'm not sure we're going to be able to do, we're not going to be able to do this at, uh, at New Year's, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to do it again at Matariki. Two tonnes of fireworks, creating 3,000 effects above Wellington in 10 minute performance. And also in that same month, that of course, uh, and Councillor Day, a big shout out to you in this one, uh, that is the month that we agreed to uh, welcome mana whenua representatives to our council table. We've obviously got Liz here for Ngāti Toa and looking forward to having a representative of Taranaki Whanui. We also agreed that we would have a, um, a Māori ward as part of uh, the next council. In 2021, The Economist ranked Wellington City as number one in the world for environmental security. That's pretty cool. And that's a reflection of places like Zealandia, uh, our urban renewal programs, 
town belt, green belt development over many, many years, Otari Wilton's Bush, and the huge involvement of our community in environmental restoration and predator free work. Next one. Uh, Zealandia, of course, also went through a, a I'd say, world leading uh, piece of work in. Um, lowering the lake and removing all the pest fish, which is, that's the biggest scale certainly that's ever been done uh, in New Zealand. Looks as though it's been spectacularly successful. Another feather in the cap for the Zealandia team. Despite all the constraints of the pandemic, the economy maintains services and growth. And this year, of course, Takina is going really, really well. It is looking fantastic. Really looking forward to having it on stream. We've already got... The reindeer, yep, we've already got 40, we've already got 40 conventions, multi-day conventions booked in for um, post-opening and of course we've got a paper today about how we manage exhibitions which I think will be really exciting and of course this year we also um, did the deal with Te Papa uh, and with Wellington NZ doing the promotion but Te Papa to actually run uh, the operation which I think is a great, great partnership going forward and that's what this is all about, partnerships. It was also a year of international milestones. Councillor Foon, yeah, you're wearing the same. <laughs> Actually, we're both wearing the same ones, I think, this time. <laughs> uh, so this one, this was signed. This, this was signing up to the Milan International Food Pact. So this is we are number 212 city in the world. This is about sort of food, making sure we reduce the amount of food waste. It's all part of our um, our and more having more food grown locally. It is all part of our commitment to being a circular economy. And of course, we also made big progress on moving towards sludge treatment and are moving towards. Uh, the, the, the residual waste and, and, and waste minimisation at the same time. And again, uh, here tribute to Councillor Foon in particular for your enthusiasm in that area. Travel restrictions uh, stopped going anywhere, but it didn't stop international dialogue. Next one. Uh, this one was uh, representing the city at the uh, Asia Pacific City Summit in Brisbane, except not in Brisbane. Uh, I've got to say, it's all very well to do these kind of things, but you don't get half what you could get out of them by being on Zoom. So, and we did reflect that back. It's not their fault, but it's just, it's just the way that these things work. And there were a lot of engagements, particularly with a number of our sister cities uh, and also with Taipei uh, on several occasions um, over the year. Part of that international uh, connection is the, our entry in the Bloomberg Philanthropies Mural Challenge. We are a finalist there. We're waiting for uh, the results of that. Here's hoping that we, uh, you know, we become one of the 13 which are selected at the end. But I've, regardless of what happens, a big shout out, particularly to Sean O'Dain, for the fantastic work that he has done uh, in putting this together. And this, in particular, is this, which I think you've seen, which is the digital twin city, which is a really powerful tool to allow people to see what's going on in our city, to see for us to be able to show what's going on, for us to envisage that. Uh, pun um, Paniki Promise is also shown in that too, so you can have a look online and be able to see everything that's going on in the Paniki Promise area, and all of the people's queries on on you know uh, on making the city safer. So a great tool for the future. Next one. Uh, we also have got a very very strong focus, and again congratulations to you all councillors on social housing and making sure that our social housing portfolio is sustainable. That's an ongoing piece of work with the government into the new year. We celebrated. We celebrated, <laughs> Laurie, what are we doing here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good work, good work, good work. Yeah. We, we, we like to, people don't do things in our city to get a pat on the back, but it is really nice to give people a pat on the back from time to time. And that's what the Absolutely Positively Wellington Awards are all about. And here are some of our Absolutely Positively Wellington Award winners who we celebrated uh, earlier this year at, at Te Papa. And we also do it for our younger people. Um, this is uh, at Scots College uh, last week. Um, and our young people are nominated by their colleges. Uh, and you know we say, well, yep, we, we'll give you an absolutely positively Wellington Student Award. These three young men, um, Liam, Ben, and Lockie, um, th I thought that was outstanding. They created, as 14 or 15 year olds, a prosthetic arm for a three-year-old, working prosthetic arm for a three-year-old. That is quite awesome. And I think that, you know, if we've got young people with that creativity and others with a, that passion for service for our community, we are in a very good place going forward. And speaking of community, um, what a great example of community, Super, Super Shot Saturday. In fact, that whole weekend was, if, if you didn't get out and get involved in that, and I know several of you did, um, it was a spectacular display of a community getting together to say, we are going to do things together. We're going to encourage people to get vaccinated. And Wellington City, big pat on the back to everybody, 
is number one, or at least the last numbers I saw, number one in the country um, as a TLA area. So I think that is hats off to every single Wellingtonian uh, for your efforts in getting vaccinated and in getting safe and to all the people who are doing the vaccinations and all the people who in the different ways, in different communities, encouraged this and did events around this. Um, and that was really neat to be able to see uh, and support several of those. And just finally, to finish off with um, some of the other things that we did this year, of course, we adopted a new arts and culture strategy, Ahutini, a very collaborative process. It was fabulous to have 45 um, of our arts and culture leaders around, not around this table physically, but around the table virtually saying, thank you for your mahi in terms of doing this co-creation with us. We also adopted the uh, strategy for children and young people. Uh, we're working on the uh, e economic strategy as well. So we're doing some good things uh, in this space as well. And I think I'm going to finish there, but just to say to all of you again, um, there are more things I could have added to that, but they, we've achieved an enormous amount this year, councillors and officers. Thank you all. Thank you to the community who's participated in all of that as well. Uh, and uh, I would just wish everybody again a very happy, safe, refreshing and relaxing Christmas and New Year. Uh, and we look forward to 2022. That takes me to, are there any conflict of interest declarations? We'll go back to the substance of the, uh, the meeting. I see none, okay. Confirmation of the minutes of the meeting held 25th of November, uh, having been circulated, uh, taken as true and correct record. Thanks, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Any discussion? No, could you vote please? Thank you. Uh, there are no items not on the agenda. The late one's fine, we don't have to do anything about that. Okay, it's fine. Okay, it takes me to public participation. Patrick. Right, welcome, again, I think uh, you've got the, the gist there. So Patrick is speaking to the petition on Thorn and Key, which of course hasn't yet been presented, but uh, no, if you, can, if you can both head on up there. We're, we're just working our way through this as we said. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, you've got uh, 10 minutes to speak Okay, in your hands. And if you want to leave time for questions, we appreciate that. Right. Yeah. I think you're allowed to, I think, or check this, you're allowed to take your mask off for speaking. Okay, thanks. Yep. Kia ora koutou. Um, democracy is a beautiful thing, and today you'll hear a range of views on a decision that you took earlier this year. I would uh, invite you today to think about your values, about your policies, and about uh, analysis rather than anecdote as you make decisions on the safety and livability of Thorndon Key. Um, also, I acknowledge staff advice here. They've done the numbers here, collected the um, parking stats and the safety stats. So we've got a firm basis to make decisions. Um, so today we're talking about safety, equity, uh, zero carbon, livability, and prosperity. I collected a few comments from our supporters about how Thorndon Key is working out since you made your decision in June. Uh, here's Erica from Berenpore. It's so frustrating that these things keep getting rehashed over and over again. Chris from Kandala, that stretch of road is much nicer and safer to ride now. Thank you for fighting the good fight. Antonia is from Karori. She has a business on Thorndon Key. Uh, her observation is that people were accustomed to parking directly outside their businesses. Um, now they have to walk um, a few dozen metres to get to their destination. And uh, she believes that the, uh, the changes are well worthwhile. I was down there this morning again to have a look at for myself. Uh, again, don't take this as an anecdote. Look at the data. There were exactly 100 vacant car parks plus um, motorbike parking and private parking adjacent to Thorndon Quay. Um, from... Edward from Tiaro, I'll be really upset if the council reverts it. I ride along there all the time and it's great now. I was nearly knocked off my bike so many times before. And Jared, who rides from Tawa, Thorndon Key is so much nicer now. I'm no longer in a hyper vigilant state, especially on the way out of the city. I come here offering solutions as well. Uh, if 
there is pressure on parking. I invite the council to review the, the turnover of parking. So possibly instead of having 10 hour parks that suit the needs of commuters, uh, more two hour, one hour, 30 minute, five minute parks that really um, promote turnover and support businesses along the quay. Your own report in front of you says on health and safety that council staff have considered the safety aspects of these proposals. Um, reversing in whole or part your decisions of June would reduce the safety of cyclists on Thorndon Quay. Is there anything you'd like to add, Alex, at this point? Um, no, just to, just to reiterate, uh, I haven't taken notes like Patrick has, but I have, um, yeah, lots of people, anyone, anyone I talk to about Thorndon Quay just says how much better it is now, how much more um, relaxed they can be cycling through there. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's encouraging people to use that route more uh, comfortably. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Time for questions. Councillors, are there any questions? Councillor Young. Um, so, uh, Patrick, thank you. Just tell me, you talked about Antonia from Karori having a business on Thorndon Key. What is the business? She didn't say. So it could be anything? That's mm. correct, any business. Mm. Mm. Okay, yeah. big awesome. Thank you. Thanks, councillors. Any other questions? Councillor Rush. Yeah, hi, Patrick. So, I mean, you tell us not to accept anecdotal evidence, and then you tell us that you were just down there today and you saw what you saw. Sure. Um, and I can tell you what happens on Evans Bay Parade every day, but that's not evidence. So, I'm just a, a little bit um, unsure as to. Um, do you, we probably haven't had enough time to see what the benefits really are and to do a proper measured analysis, do you think? It's only been in place for, what, three months, four months? That, that would be a good argument for leaving it as it is, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I, yeah. Well, as I was also, asking you. Just on your question about anecdote and data, I mean, your, your officer's report in front of you, uh, I'm sure you've read it, talks about parking occupancy mm. through the last couple of years, and yeah. the data is really clear. Yeah. That there is far below 100% occupancy, and by increasing parking turnover, things get even better for retailers. Yeah, it's a bit inconsistent with the retailers' views who, who are actually there on the ground, I suppose. Do, do, do you know how to reconcile Again, that? You have, da you have sensors in the ground which measure parking turnover, mm. so I think I'd, I'd trust you know council data yeah. on this point. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Sure. Happy Christmas. Please go and have a look any day you like, and you'll see the situation. Oh, I was down there last week not yeah, to okay. do that, but. Councillor. <laughs> Thanks. All right, is there anyone else? Thank you, Patrick. I think been, you've been very, very clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> okay. okay. That takes us to the actual introduction of the petition. So, oh, uh, we've got to have the petition actually okay. introduced, don't we? Oh, so I'm going to uh, welcome uh, Paul and Paul Robinson and Dale Scott. Um, and I'm going to give you up to 10 minutes to speak if you want to as well. Uh, kia ora kato. Uh, my name is Paul Robinson and this is Dale. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to thank um, two councillors. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Councillor Pannett coming down uh, to Thorndon Key and spending some time down there discussing the situation with us and inviting us to present this petition at one of the uh, uh, meetings before the end of year. So uh, thank you very much for your assistance with that. I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Councillor Calvert for her constant ongoing advocacy uh, for those of us in her ward. Uh, Dale will present our petition very shortly, but before he starts, the, uh, I just want to refer to two things in your very good uh, presentation, Mr. Mayor. Uh, firstly, I was thinking about, um, about the new reservoir and the care and attention that was paid prior to construction there to make sure that all the lizards, the habitat of the lizards, was not disturbed. I, sit, I think about that every morning when I come down Kaifora Gorge and I congratulate the council for the care and attention. Uh, the second thing I want to refer to, uh, referring to your comments about Zealandia, is that this week, for the first time, I saw kaka <coughs> in the, uh, in the uh, Bahutakawa trees uh, along Thorndon Quay. Um, it's great to see that the kaka uh, now have a habitat on Thorndon Quay. And just to remind councillors, 
that we who have businesses down there, that is our habitat. And what we feel is that there are decisions being made strongly in favour of people who are passing through whose habitat it is not. So that's my um, introduction. Uh, Dale will present the petition. Thanks for that, Paul, and thank you for having us this morning. Um, I think it's worthwhile just prefacing and saying we're, we're not against introducing a safety design control solution to Thorn and Key. We're all for that. All we have done to date is challenged the effectiveness and the wisdom of the solution that has been implemented to date. Um, and to that end, we just want to work with the council to co-design a solution that is evidence-based and effective. Um, so to that end, we've, if we can please go to the next slide. We've presented this petition because we feel that there is a big disjunct between uh, the way that uh, certain statistics have been interpreted and in our view strained and then presented and what we're actually experiencing, uh, boots on the ground. Um, and we have, you know, 1,250 signatures and counting of a wide plurality of uh, people from different backgrounds who are all experiencing difficulties since the change was implemented. Um, and we've got there a, a selection of comments which are by no means uh, meant to operate as evidence, um, but they're echoing certain themes that we have um, cited as issues. So to that end, you know, we are putting forward to the council that there are a number of issues which are unresolved and are not settled by the data that's been put forward to date. So that's car park utilisation, safety post the car park conversion, social and economic impacts, accessibility, climate change implications and broader fiscal issues. Next slide, please. So let's go to the data because I think that's a great place to look. Um, Data is a great thing if it is interpreted honestly and in good faith, and it is comparative. Um, we've reviewed the data, and there are significant differences, for example, that make it not possible to uh, compare the Becker 2019 and 2017 data with the Wellington City Council 2020 data, because the methodology was so substantively different. The Becker data did not count any cars that stayed for 15 minutes or less. Yet in the Wellington City Council data, they identified that 41% of car use instances were for 10 minutes or less. Um, and in their analysis, they counted cars that stayed for one minute or less. Um, and then I see that you've done another review of car census statistics. It was great to see uh, a consistent one minute or less application. But then, as was noted, many sensors are not working since the conversion. And there's also been substantial uh, works along that street which have led to a material number of car parks coned off. It's also worth noting that one of the uh, relevant periods that the data was collected was during alert level four and three, when there was virtually no trade uh, along Thornton Quay. So um, not quite sure why that was included. Um, and then we have at the end there the Thorn and Key um, visually observed data, which shows and accounts for uh, coned off car parks um, and sensors that are out of action. Um, and it shows at present a 77% average occupancy. Now, if we go to the next slide, it shows. Now, if you go and account for the 15 minute and under car park usage that wasn't counted in 2017 and 2019, your 60% occupancy quite logically leaps substantially, given that Wellington City Council has identified that 41% of car use um, is 10 minutes and under. Now, what this shows is as the Wellington economy recovers from COVID, we see a return to normal trade and in turn, occupancy rates that reflect normal circumstances in the future. Next slide, please. So if Thornton Key car parking capacity is sufficient to meet demand, why do we have 1,250 people complaining? The data reliability and interpretation issues that we've identified demonstrate 
that this issue is not resolved. It remains at large, and that is why we were asking for a post-implementation review. Um, and again, you know, going to the analysis that was surfaced in today's minutes, I think you'd find Trump's tax lawyers would do a more honest analysis of data. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, look, can I just suggest that that's probably not helping your case to, to say that. Um, that, that, that. That will be regarded as uh, somewhat inflammatory, so just, yeah. Uh, if, that, if a councillor had said that, they would be asked to withdraw and apologise. So. Okay, well, yeah. I'll withdraw and apologise. Right, I just you. do note that there is uh, a lack of good faith in the data and the way it was presented in the minutes for today. Now, going to net reduction and safety for all users, um, the angle to parallel park, car park conversion um, did not comply with the health and safety design requirements under the Health and Safety at Work Act. There was no analysis of any new hazards that would be introduced by the conversion or pre-existing hazards that would be inflated or increased as a result of the conversion. Now, since we have uh, been uh, observing the impact of the change, we've seen a number of new significant hazards introduced. You've now got, because of the lack of car park capacity, a very high volume number of U-turns, which are dangerous. You've got double parking because people who often stay for short periods can't find a park, so they double park next to other cars. Um, and this happens to be in the cycle corridor. And then you've also got the hazards associated with parallel parks, which on the council and Waka Kotahi's own evidence presented actually have a higher incident rate per car park than angled parks. And then we also see many instances of cars mistaking the new gap between parallel parking and the car lane as a second lane and driving in it. Uh, now, these are hazards which I think over time will bear out to result in uh, serious injury incidents, which are far greater than those that the angled parks would have caused, particularly if our suggested design controls were adopted. Next page, please. So how is Thorndon Key uh, safer for cyclists when parking conversion has introduced so many new hazards? Again, this is an issue that is at large because the health and safety and design requirements were not complied with. Uh, next slide, please. So social and economic impacts. Um, we are already compiling a robust uh, set of data from a multitude of different retailers and service providers showing that revenue is down significantly since the September introduction of the car park conversion. Um, now, car park proximity, there is a blind reliance on the idea that people will walk a long distance. Now, there's a key stretch that is often 100% of capacity. People will not walk 200 metres to go and attend a business, they'll double park or they won't go at all. And if they have accessibility issues, for example, if they're elderly, um, if they're mo mobile impaired, or if they have children, it also presents an accessibility issue. Okay, so we've already got two um, businesses that are gonna leave the area. So we're gonna have Thorndon Key hollowed out. That's gonna impact lease values and property and you'll have urban sprawl and lost jobs, which is contra to a compact city objective. Uh, next slide, please. And to that end, removing car parks won't change vehicle reliance. You don't have a suitable viable alternative for a lot of the businesses uh, that are visited, trade customers, families, um, and people who have accessibility issues. Um, so they will just simply go to a similar alternative that's located further afield, drive further, um, and the Dale, can I get can I get you to wind up, please? I, yes. So yeah, technically I've already given you ten rather than the five I was advised. So um, if I can get you and not say. Oh, we were told 10. By yeah, well, I would have thought it was 10, so I just took the unilateral decision to make it 10, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, um, look, all we're pointing out is that you'll score an own goal climate-wise through this change. Um, so happy to take questions. Uh, unfortunately, there, aren't, there isn't time for questions because you've taken the 10 minutes. Sorry about that. I mean, we would like to discuss whether or not uh, yeah. you will post implementation review. Yeah. Look, I, I understand that, but our standing orders only allow for the 10 minutes, not for going then having a, a long conversation thereafter.
Okay. Uh, last time you went over time because it was an important issue. Yeah. Yeah, look, I'm sorry, we're not going to do that this time. It is, it is 10 minutes to present the petition. It's not to then have a discussion about it. We can have a discussion at a later stage. Very happy to do that. But it won't be, it won't be today. Okay, then. Is the petition available for us to read? Papers. It's not, not in my paper. Is yeah. it a next okay. somewhere? Right. No, it's Read it in the papers. Somewhere. Okay, councillors. So, councillors, I'd I'm like to ask... see the petition, please. Okay, where? What page? Page number what? Councillor. Eight. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes it's better just to be a little bit more patient. Oh, just could have just told me where it was in the paper. I think the councillors were trying to do what that. What was the next? Moana is going to uh, introduce the paper, please. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, Mayor and Councillors. Um, I'm just going to introduce the paper briefly and then we're happy to move to questions. So I'm here with Brad Singh, who's our Manager of Transport and Infrastructure, and Kevin Black, who's our Manager of Parking Services. And I'm presenting you this paper as the Wellington City Council partner lead for Let's Get Wellington Moving. Um, so broadly, our response can be uh, separated into two parts. One is looking back at the change that's already been made on Thorndon Key, and the second part is looking ahead at future changes uh, that might be made uh, through the Thorndon Key Hut Road project through Let's Get Wellington Moving. So if we look back at the changes that you made a decision on in June, and that were implemented in September. I just remind you that those were made for safety reasons. Uh, Waka Kotahi had been asking us to make those changes going back to, I think, 2015, Brad. Um, uh, we brought papers to councils a couple of times in order to try and get that change through, and in June this year, uh, that change was made. So um, I remind you that you made this decision less than six months ago, so our strong recommendation is that we not overturn that decision, particularly given that it was made for safety purposes. Um, then we look forward uh, to, to the uh, potential future changes as we go into the design process for Thorndon Key Hut Road. So in quarter one next year, you will have a paper coming to you at committee for the single stage business case for Thorndon Key Hut Road, where you will get an opportunity to get further information, to ask questions of the program, uh, and to have uh, input into that decision and ultimately make that decision. We then move through a period of engagement as we go through design. That engagement will be with all the key stakeholders in Thorne Key Hut Road and obviously the businesses are a very important key stakeholder. Um, that is the place where there can be significant input and influence into the future design of Thorne Key Hut Road. Then there will be a consultation process on any traffic resolutions that result from that design work. So full consultation again. So um, our advice is that there is going to be ample opportunity to influence this project, to have input, and for there to be proper engagement and consultation in the coming year. Um, that's why you'll see that our advice uh, is very much we just carry on uh, with the project, leave the decision that you made less, less than six months ago for safety reasons in place. Um, I do want to thank the uh, petitioners for their patience um, in allowing us an extra week to bring this paper to you in order to, for us to be able to accommodate our late, latest parking data. We've been very upfront in the paper that uh, where there are limitations with the data, we're being very upfront and honest about that. We've said to you that there were some sensors that weren't particularly working. Kevin can speak to that. We've acknowledged that there's been construction disruption on Thorndon Key, which is taking out some car parks, and Brad can speak to that, but ultimately we stand by um, our sensor data, and what you saw is what we expected, um, and is what the modelling expected, which is an um, uplift in occupancy on Thorndon Key, but there is still capacity throughout the day uh, for people who go there. So I think I'll just leave it at that for my introductory comments, but I'm happy to take questions. And uh, Brad or Kevin, is there anything that needs to be added there, or...? Just happy to help with questions. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, I've got councillors Young, Free and Condi. Oh, I'm Pamit. Yep. Oh, Councillor Young. Right, th oh, thanks, Moana. So just a couple of... Oh, God, I've forgotten council. Yeah, we, 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 we will this time, yeah. We'll. Um, <laughs> so so it's, it's interesting, right? that's the car data and parking data. But what about the foot traffic data? I mean, do we have any data on the um, shop's turnover? Although I know that can be slightly skewed because of the... COVID. But do, I mean, I know anecdotally that people who used to go there to lunch, for example, just don't go anywhere near it because they're worried about getting a park. So I just wonder if we have any evidence about that. Um, I'm not sure, Brad, if we have any. 
Um, our pedestrian data isn't uh, as thorough as our vehicle uh, data, but I can have a look and, and see what we've got along Thornton Key and, and do a comparison pre and post uh, implementation. Uh, is it possible to do it also to include pre-COVID because that has skewed everything? Um, it, it depends how much data we actually have in the foot traffic space and, and when we would have done our surveys. So I'll, I'll go back and have a look at, at when the surveys were done and, and what could be put together. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, look, um, I appreciate that the occupancy rate would go up as we would expect, but is it, um, would we roughly be working towards an 85% occupancy rate as still being fairly um, desirable? Um, so yeah, so we're still working to it. In our current LTP, we have uh, measures in there in terms of what peak and peak occupancy might well look like, and what average, average occupancy would look like. And in the paper, we've um, talked to that in terms of what uh, peak occupancy is turning out to be, both pre and post the change. Um, and as you can see from that, we're still quite a long way from that point. Thanks, uh, Councillor Condy. Thank you. Um, first of all, I was wondering, do we have any information on how we're going with the time-limited parking that we provided for the ECE centre and, and how many of those parks are in place right now? All those parks are in place. How many was that? Um, I think in total we added in an additional four parks. I thought it was four. Um, and during the consideration of the traffic resolution, we considered the possibility we might provide more time limited parking once it had been once we've been implemented is that a conversation that we can now go back and have with the businesses it's been in place for three months could we go back and start talking about whether we need new different time restrictions loading zones those sorts of things can we do that now we can start to have those conversations what we were waiting for was to have some sensible parking data that we could then base our evidence uh, on and now that we've got that we can start having those conversations through traffic resolution processes and finally, can we just um, respond, please, to the queries that have been raised by the businesses about the reliability of our parking? So they raised queries about the sensors not working and about data being collected during levels three and four. Uh, so just to um, be clear that when we were in the process of moving the parks from being angle parks to parallel parks, then at, at that, as that process was happening, our sensors were moved and put back in. Um, so there was a slight, as they were done progressively, there would have been outages on a, on a sensor by sensor basis. Um, they are all up and running. I have no information to say that we are not receiving data from our sensors and we um, would know that because we receive information from the system that tells us when sensors are working or not working. So there is no data that I'm aware of that says our sensors are not um, all up and running currently in that area. Thank you. Uh, councillors, I've got councillors Panett, Calvert, Foon and Rush. Um, thank you for all your work. I'm just wondering two things, whether you would be really objecting to do an, an independent survey, just to give some confidence. I'm not in any way questioning your work, but just to help, just given there were some variances. I mean, our advice is that we don't need it, we have sensor data. And if we have confidence in the sensor data, we don't need to spend extra resource on an independent review. Okay, so just for clarity. And the second question was, I was just wondering if you would um, mind if we amended that uh, recommendation too, just to point out that there are further processes and further opportunities for consultation, just because otherwise it just looks a bit blunt, we're not gonna do anything. Yep, absolutely. Cool, thank you. Um, if, we can, <coughs> if we can work up some words for that, that would be helpful. Yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Calvert. Um, thank you. Um, there seems to be a lot of um, emphasis on the um, parking data, but as we've heard, there's the pedestrian data and there's you know there's other data as well because this is not just about traffic. This is about placemaking. So how do you get the other data? Because that needs to be a factor in this. So typically our surveys are done by uh, people doing measurements of the amount of pedestrians uh, walking along the footpath. So um, historically, that hasn't been something that we've collected as intensively as uh, traffic data. Uh, that's why I'll need to go back and actually see what's available for Thornland Key. So the, um, in the petition, it does call for um, you know, a, a post-implementation review of sorts. So would that, and, and to ensure that it is comprehensive, would that not help in, in, in the next stage? 
Well, I think the point we make is that the, change, the only change that we've made so far was made for safety reasons. Um, and we're about to go through an intensive process of engagement and consultation through the design process where all the matters that you're raising will be considered. We want to know the needs of businesses and how we can reflect that in the changes that we make on Thorndon Key. So I think once we get through that process, we can potentially have a conversation, but the only change we've made so far was made for safety reasons. And, and that's fine. It's just that what do we do now that it changes and how do how do you get the data? You know, because I'm, I'm just trying to understand is how you're going to get the data that's going to inform your design. And, and surely a post-implementation review would actually help support that. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll reiterate that, that the change has only been in place for two to three months. Um, so there is a period of us collecting data to inform any decisions going forward. Uh, we've got a number of things in place now that the parking sensors are all up and running. We can collect parking data, we can do the pedestrian counts. I've also got cameras focused there to do a post-implementation safety review. Um, but again, that takes a bit of time to, to do and we've got to collect the data before we can actually do any of those. Okay. Um, now the other aspect to this is about engaging with the, with the, with the people in the community. Um, uh, as well, you know, there's other broader stakeholders, people who travel through. Um, given the concerns raised about the engagement that occurred early on, or the lack of engagement before going out to consultation, and we know that Let's Get Welly Moving have just even recently acknowledged that they need to engage better, how will um, officers ensure, our officers, WCC, ensure that that engagement actually does happen properly? Yeah, look, ab absolutely, and, and you're right, the program has acknowledged that the at the beginning of the Golden Mile engagement wasn't up to scratch, and we have a very strong commitment from the program to do a lot better. We, of course, we have what we're legally required to do, but we need to do a lot better than that. And I know, Councillor Calvert, that you and your colleagues will be watching very closely and providing feedback where you see fit, and I welcome that feedback, um, as does the program. Um, I guess the only point that I would put on the table is even the world's best engagement doesn't always reach agreement. Um, but we want people to feel that they've been listened to and that their voices have been heard. And also we do have we do have a broad range of stakeholders and we need to balance all of those voices. But absolutely I agree with you that we um, that this engagement needs to be genuine, um, not just legally compliant, it needs to be meaningful. And, and, and we tried to get that early in the year, I know I yep. did, um, and it was refused. Um, so. Um, just in terms of, there was meant to be a paper today from Let's Get Welly Moving, this business case that was talked about, and it was actually scheduled for this council meeting. Why the delay? Um, so there have been a couple of reasons. COVID obviously has impacted a lot of things, but we've had delays from some of our consultants in getting information back to us. That sector is under enormous pressure at the moment. Ours is not the only project that's um, been affected by that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Calvert. Councillor Foon. And, and just before Councillor Foon, um, uh, uh, if I can say, we're just sort of picking up Councillor Panett's quite reasonable suggestion, suggested that we replace two with something like, note there will be significant further engagement associated with the LGWM planning for Hutt Road, Thorn and Key. So at um, least reflects Mayor, that. I've got some amendments of yeah, Well, you may well have, but, but at least that reflects that there is more work being done. Yep. yep. Um, kia ora, and this follows on from Councillor Condi's question and the, um, the uh, issues raised by Patrick this morning. Um, just around the 10-hour parks for consumers, so do we still have 10-hour, uh, sorry, for consumers, for um, commuters, do we still have those 10-hour parks there and will they be reviewed so that with the intention that they might become higher turnover parking? Yeah. And how many? How when, many have we got? When we when we made the change initially, uh, we identified that towards the bottom end of Thorn and Key, there were quite a few commuter parks, 10-hour commuter parks, and the idea was always that once we collected enough data post-implementation that we would review that. And so that's still on the table uh, in terms of us reviewing going forward. The rush thing, Councillor Condi, again. Um, thanks, guys. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to ask that. Yeah. Just, um, yeah. first of all, how do the sensors work? What, 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 what do you mean by sensors? Because the parks that I use don't have an obvious sensor. Um, we go to the machine and pay your thing. So is there some sort of infra infrared sort of sensor which is beaming information back to you somewhere? Yes. yes. Um, but 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 just to explain a little bit more. So so in in 
in each of the metered car parks, so car parks where people are required to pay to park, you'll see there's a little round disc in the, in the centre of the car park. Um, that is the sensor. That sensor records when a vehicle um, uh, parks or comes and sits over the top of it. It also records when a vehicle moves away from it. Um, when that happens, we receive information through the system that lets us know whether that, ca that car park is currently occupied or unoccupied. Uh, we also use that data to understand whether or not a person has paid for that park or not paid for that park or whether they've exceeded the posted time limit. And, and we send our parking officers, our, our parking officers are directed to where those vehicles are using that technology. Oh, I'm loving this. This sounds great. <laughs> Um, so, so how do you calculate the, the average? Because obviously during the night we wouldn't expect anyone to be there and I'm just a bit concerned, is, do you take into account the times of the day where you wouldn't expect pe to, people to be parked outside a, a shop or so on? So the, uh, just to talk to the peak occupancy, so the peak occupancy records um, the exact time of the day that the majority of parks are in use. So if you look at the stats we've put into the paper there, um, prior to the changes being made, uh, during the weekday peak, 1pm uh, was the sort of the peak period for, for the most number of car parks to be occupied, um, and um, that was around about 48%. Um, and the average is the average for the day, for the operating day that we're operating. That's what we've right. put in here. So yeah. we operate between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. And that's what the, the stats are referring to. OK. And just any comment on um, Dale's uh, analysis of the statistics and the how I think council was recording less than one minute. Does, does it really make a difference? So the sensors, um, as soon as the, uh, a vehicle parks on a sensor, we receive that information. So there isn't a lag. Um, so uh, if a sensor's on there for, a, if, sorry, if a vehicle's on there for a minute, then it will record that. Um, and we receive that information once the vehicle removes itself from that park, we receive that information. Yeah, just one more, Your Worship. So just so I'm very clear, so if a c car comes on, parks for a minute, and nothing else is parked for the hour, then that park is recorded as one minute for that hour as in use. Yeah, it's recorded that there was some there was a vehicle parked on there for the period of time that the vehicle was parked on there. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Councillor Condi, I'm going to let you ask another question because I want to get the clarity that officers are comfortable <laughs> yeah. with the words that you Well, I've just been emailing yeah. Siobhan as well. Yeah. Um, just following up on this idea that we might make we could make further changes through a traffic resolution process if there's requirements for time restrictions, loading zones, all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Mobility parks. Um, what would be the process for us to go through that? Would it um, do we need to get a request for action from from um, the businesses? How would we um, kick that off? A request for action is probably uh, the best way to, to kick it off. Uh, that indicates that there's community will for something to happen. Uh, we would then go through an investigation in terms of uh, what could be done, but also being very aware of the changes that could potentially come from Let's Get Well Into Moving as well. So. I guess, um, uh, would officers be comfortable if we if we put something in that, that notes that if we receive a request from action from the businesses for time restrictions, that that will be followed up? I'll be comfortable with that. Okay, thank you. So are you going to suggest those words or not? Yes, I will. Yeah, uh, do you want, do, no, can you, can you ask, the, ask yeah. if they're comfortable with those words then? What? Yeah, please. <laughs> are we, are we, okay, right, okay. Well, you've written them to me, so, right, hang on. <laughs> Oh, you're changing. Okay, right. Okay, um, uh, Councillor Condi is uh, is um, cogitating on a um, an additional recommendation along those lines. So um, to to add to the substantive, and I'd rather add it to the substantive than than have an amendment. And that's in that light. Um, can I just ask one question? Which is just, can you just give us a bit of a heads up on the timing for the next set of engagement? And I'm actually interested in that from the context in the context of the setting up of hearings panels for later on. The ca the timing we have for the Hut Road Thorn and Cap. So, so like I said, you, you might give us anything related to Golden Mile as well. Okay, I've got all, got to Wiles here also from the the program. You might be able to speak to Golden Mile, Thornakey Hut Road. You've got the SSBC coming to you in a paper in the first quarter. Quarters, oh sorry, single stage business case for Thornakey Hut Road. Um, this is my life now, and um, <laughs> yeah. Um, quarters two and quarter three uh, will be where we do the engagement on Thorn and Key Hut Road with a view to bringing um, traffic resolutions back in quarter four next year. So, so, in terms, so in terms of engagement and people coming to talk to the committee, or a committee? It won't be before June next year. Won't be before June, okay. Unless right. people want to do public participation on the paper that comes and in. Go, and Golden Mile? 
I'll get Gunter to come to the lectern. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, the plan is that we'll be coming back with, uh, as we discussed, the 50% design of Golden Mile before you break up um, as, a, as a council and then coming back with 100% detailed design at the end of uh, next calendar year. So, so the, que the question is, um, when are we going to have people who are going to want to make submissions and talk to committee in terms of either traffic resolutions or design issues? It'll be a similar time with Thornton Key. Right, okay. Well, that's helpful for the discussion later on in the day. Right, cool. You got your words? Okay. Yeah, I've just emailed and I'll read them out as well. Um, so just a suggestion would be, note that if businesses bring a request for action on the need for additional time restrictions, loading zones or mobility parking, that staff will process that request through a traffic resolution process now that the parking changes have been in place for several months. That sounds fine. Okay. I'll send that to you. Uh, one, one, one last question, and then I'm going to to move the paper, and I think I will do that. Yeah, yeah, it's morning tea. Yeah, we'll get on the table anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Uh, one last question, Councillor Councillor Calvert. Thank you. This last minute um, thing there, um, but just. Um, <laughs> And I know, I, I didn't mean to say that actually last minute because I haven't got a last minute amendment. Um, so um, look, it's just, yeah, I know, exactly. Um, so um, just with um, officers, we, this is could bring back to you, but look, a couple of weeks ago, we were dealing with papers in high tie tie about parking. I know I've got issues for, you know, in, I'm um, trying to raise around Wadestown about parking and traffic resolutions. I mean, what's the capacity of the organisation to deal with such requests? Um, this is not a significant uh, change. So a residence parking scheme, which is similar to what we were talking about at, in the Hatai Tai, requires a significant amount of work before we can implement. Here we've got an existing park with an existing time restriction that it's simply just resoluting a change to that time restriction. Right, so it's just, but, but but you'd have to do the work, the analysis, pre presumably, before you, you put forward a, a traffic resolution. Yeah, but this would be based on the parking sensor data that we've already collected. Right, okay, so just, yeah, okay, thank you. Councillors, um, I think what we'll do is we'll take, we will take the break, I think, uh, and then um, I will, I'm gonna move the, um, the motion after break. Councillor Calvert, I am aware you have some amendments. I'd rather those are amendments rather than an amended substantive, so I think we'll do it that way. That's fine. Okay, cool. Okay, so councillors, um, what we're going to do is we're going to take till, we'll take um, if we need, and I think I've got to say we take that, we'll take until the um, uh, until 11 o'clock. Uh, the reason for that, a oh, reminder about masks, right, okay. Um, so if you're going outside, masks. And also, also morning tea masks. That's going to be very <laughs> difficult eating. Um, so 11 o'clock. Now, councillors, can I ask you to come back? Have we got the, the room next door? Is that free at the moment, do you know? Yeah. Look, if you can get something to eat and then come back, because I do want to just w work our way through. And actually, probably I'd like Jen as well, just to work through, and maybe Stephen, just to work through the issue around the, um, the, the hearings panels while over the break. Okay? That's why we're taking the extended time. So we'll come back at 11 o'clock.
Uh, so I'm going to move the uh, the paper on the petition with uh, a slight amendment to the substantive. I think we all felt that the uh, agree no further action needs to be taken was a little, uh, uh, well, not neither accurate nor uh, and a little inflammatory. Um, I d I, look, I do want to recognise um, the uh, the petitioners, um, and it's, it's clearly a substantial issue uh, for the um, the business community there. Uh, and I've said that we need, we do need to sit down, and have a proper conversation. Having a conversation at a council meeting is not the way that you're going to have a decent, a decent discussion of looking through numbers and uh, and what the actual implications are. But I would make, I would make the observation: this council has tried four times to make even those modest changes to improve a long-standing safety issue. This council's done it. Other councils, two other councils, I think, failed on casting votes. Uh, the last council, of course, the mayor, the then mayor, took, but took it off the table. Um, now, we've actually made that decision. I think we need to let it bed in. Um, but we also need to recognise, and that is what the amendment says, or the amended substantive says, is that there's a significant amount more to come in terms of discussion. And I think, uh, with respect to the submission, there's kind of two parts to it. It was the looking back to the changes which have been made, the modest changes which have been made, but it was also inviting us to look forward to the changes which are we don't actually even have in front of us yet. I mean, we've got pictures, we've got some ideas about what they look at, like at a high level, um, but they're not actually in front of us yet, and they won't be in front of us until the first quarter of, of next year. So I think that that is what the amended substantive um, uh, now says, uh, and also picks up the, the comments that Councillor Condi uh, made in terms of um, any uh, immediate response issues that might be in terms of um, traffic resolution uh, requests. So I'm going to move, uh, second to Councillor Condi, do you want a second? Okay, do you wish to speak? Thanks everyone. Um, yeah, I just want to note that, that this was a really important decision that we made for the cycling community and fundamentally it was an issue about a safety decision that we made to improve safety along that corridor. And um, it's great to hear from the business community and, and hear their concerns about how it's being implemented and I definitely want us to respond to those things. But I think we need to be clear that we don't respond to any concerns by going back to where we were before. I think we need to respond by moving forward. And um, and really the, the point of three there is to make sure that we can hear from the community. If, they, if they've got specific suggestions about loading zones, mobility parking, time restrictions, things that we can do that will improve how this works on the ground for them, that we would be delighted <laughs> to hear from them and we would be delighted to work with them to bring those changes about. Um, that's, that's really what, what I want to say is that we would want to work together to figure out how we move forward on this programme and this project together with them. Um, but for me at least I think we have to, and I think uh, a number of people around this table agree that the safety of cyclists and the original reason why we made this change still stands and we still have to prioritise that. Um, and I just wanted to remind you what it says in the parking policy, um, and I think that this is the way for us to treat this, as we've made a safety change, that safety change is gonna stay in place, and now if there are, are effects on, the par on parking, then we need to use the parking policy to respond to those. So again, um, we would go to the parking policy and say, actually, does occupancy regularly exceed 85% at peak time? Now, the data we have even from the Thorn and Key Collective says we're not there yet, but we can keep an eye on that, and our sensor data will do that. And then what we would do at that time is then start looking at time restrictions, <laughs> loading zones, mobility, parking, and other changes that can help us to manage the demand that's there. So I think that that's the appropriate way for us to go forward at this point in time. And I really hope that um, you know we can work with the Thorn and Key Collective to make practical changes on the ground that will improve the situation. Council Condi, uh, anyone else wish to speak? Well, you better you better speak and speak to it then. Otherwise, it's not there. So, Councillor Calvert. Thank you. Um, and um, for those, I travel down this road pretty much daily at different times of the day. Um, so I, I do know it quite well, and I, I've, I know it's before and after the changes. And and I just like to say that. Um, People talk about we haven't done much since 2015. Um, we did move a resolution to do some improvements in 2018. That was never implemented as a um, council. Um, and so we moved, and, and so that to me is quite critical. I think you've got to remember about Thorndon Key, there's two distinct parts. There's the general um, 
um, general shops area. Then there's the area down by Freedom, which is where that commuter parking is. And no one's talking about essentially that commuter parking. Businesses around that area have off-street parking available. Um, the Gateway Centre, Razine, City Fitness, those places generally have um, um, and have been existing for quite some time. It's further up where there is no commuter parking. Now, um, this is not um, this has not gone well. Um, I know I spoke to officers back in, um, I think it was March, April, wanting them to engage with specifically with the Thorndon um, community about proposed changes. And they were just said, no, you have to wait till the main consultation comes out. I think that was completely inappropriate and unfair. Um, and so what we want to do is ensure that there is proper engagement and um, that does happen because we're continually promised that we're going to improve our engagement. I've been hearing this for the last few years, especially around, around Let's Get Welly Moving. And um, as Patrick Morgan said, it's got to be an analysis, not anecdotes. So that's why we need a proper um, review. Now, the, the, um, the Thornton Collective aren't saying reverse the decision. No one's saying that. But let's ba make sure whatever we do next is based on good information. And parking policy is not placemaking. It's not just about parking, it's about how people use that space. So it's whether it's pedestrians, whether people travel their different ways, by, by bus, cycle, whatever. Um, so we need good um, information and not just based on parking policy to make sure that um, area thrives going forward. So. Um, I think we just, and I, it's, it's heartening to hear the, the mayor wants to talk, um, you know, well, let's get them around the table. They've been asking for that for nearly 12 months on this one. The reason the other thing was cancelled a couple of years ago, again, they had been asking for, for their... Um, um, for their interest to also be considered and given um, weight without um, without going straight to the solution, without understanding. So what this amendment is, is that we will conduct an independent review, and this will be really useful, because what we will get from this is probably um, lessons that will help us with any future engagement as well, and future that we can build in to other pieces of work. Um, and, um, and it may be stating the obvious, but the Second Amendment is about making sure that they do engage comprehensively. Councillor, if I can get you to wind up, that would be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, with this group of stakeholders, and not just treated as part of the 200,000 people living in Wellington City. So, um, look, I do ask you to support this. This is not reverting back, but this is actually just saying, let's make sure we, we base future decisions on good evidence and we collect that information and it is broad enough to not just be based on parking policy. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Young, do you wish to speak at this point? No. no okay. Um, we might have some questions of officers on this. Um, so I'm going to start off with a um, question, first of all, actually the mover of the motion and then of the officers. Um, so Councillor Calvert, you, you've said you, in five, and I'm sympathetic to that kind of concept, but you've said you want to you want to ensure LGWM engages comprehensively prior to any formal consultation. So can you just explain how you can, ex you can do comprehensive engagement before you do any... Well, because engagement should probably, it should normally follow um, consultation. It's, con engagement doesn't always happen alongside consultation. It's about working with those stakeholders and saying, okay, we've got some ideas, what's going to work? Let's, let's bring yours into the mix and say, okay, we've got a solution, maybe 80%, right? We will now go out and so formally it's co consult. co-creating. You can yep. call it co-creating. Okay, cool, right. But, okay. but, you, but um, that might, that, be, too okay. that might be too strong a word for got officers. I, I, I got, got the general gist. Sorry, now I'm going to ask Moana for <laughs> questions. So um, I, just a very simple question really is your advice, I think you've given us advice on four, but um, if you can give us uh, your clear advice on both four and five and the reasons for that advice. Sure, so um, on, on four we don't agree because we don't think it's needed. So we don't think we can justify putting the additional resource. Um, we'll work through that as we go through the processes over the next year. Uh, in terms of number five, we're happy with that. Um, recommendation, as I said when during the Q&A session, we are planning to do um, significant engagement prior to any consultation process on traffic resolutions anyway next year. That's always been part of the plan, so we're quite happy to have that captured in, a, in, a, uh, in an amendment. It was five's okay, four's not? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Other questions? Councillor Matthews. And 
Does five new. change anything? Okay. Uh, no. Hmm. Oh, sorry, say, say, say again. Say again. I said, I said Does five change anything? Yeah. The answer was no. No. So, yeah. Yeah, well, there are probably quite a few amendments that come into that category. <laughs> Councillors. Uh, Councillor, Councillor O'Neill. Yes, we do. I just wanted to understand the implication of a comprehensive independent review and what the cost might be associated with that or resourcing. Uh, Kevin or Brad, I'm not sure about um, the cost. I mean, at the moment, the only thing to review is the safety changes that we made. Um, we're about to go through a process of design where we will be designing the entire corridor, um, where everything is up for discussion. Um, and so we don't feel that at this point a review would, would add any value, but I'll hand it over to Brad about the cost. Um, a comprehensive independent review of parking utilization, pedestrian traffic, social economic will be in the tens of thousands of dollars to, to do, probably around forty, fifty thousand dollars to do. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rush, Condi Day. Uh, just for Councillor Calvert and maybe Moana, so in, in terms of four, uh, what sort of timing did you have envisaged uh, for that to be done and completed? That's of clearly off the mover. I would envisage you? that, sorry, <laughs> do you want to stand? Um, I would envisage that to be done within the next um, six months, um, working in to be able to provide input into the next stage of Thorndon Key. So depending on when that is, because I know that's a bit of a moving feast at the moment. And, and that's thanks for that, because I was going to ask Moana, so, you know, would this be able to be accommodated as part of that uh, next phase of work? Um, I guess anything can be accommodated. What we're saying is we, we don't think at this stage it would add any value, and as you've heard, it would be significant cost and it could potentially slow down the process, which is not what we want to do, given that we want to bring that single-stage business case to you in the first quarter. But we're about to embark on a significant process of engagement um, and then consultation, so we think that these matters can be addressed and the data can be collected through that process. Just one more, Your Worship. What, what's, what are we doing down Thorndon Key? I thought that... that taking away the parks and uh, is this now more firm permanent designs and so forth that we're going to be doing yeah, with so a lot Thorn of money? Yes, Thornakee Hut Road is one of the um, three-year delivery uh, programs, so let's get Wellington moving along with Golden Mile and Cobham Drive. Yeah. So, but this is the bit that goes out to the hut then, is it? Or Oh, sh Council Councillor Rush, I think maybe I wouldn't be asking these questions at the moment. We'll, we'll, t we'll tell you later on. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Condy. Um, thanks, Moana. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of number four, is there anything, any items in that list of, of the, that we don't have the expertise to do either in-house or through Let's Get Wellington Moving? So it kind of comes back to this independent review. Do we actually need a, an independent set of skills because we can't do any of those things ourselves, or do we have the expertise across us in the program to deliver on all of those? We probably have the expertise in-house. It's a question of priorities and whether this is something that we want to prioritise given the work programme that we've already got to deliver. OK. More questions? No, no, no. You can't ask a question, Councillor, Pan uh, Councillor Calvert. No, you can no, Councillor Calvert, you should know the answer to all the questions on your own, on your own amendment. Um, Councillor Pannett. Um, thanks, Brad. So just to clarify, we've got in-house expertise for economic impact on retail or other businesses? We could do that. It depends if we can get the data. Um, so yeah, no, so Baz's team is doing some work on that. Sorry. Presumably then the retail or the businesses could give you the data that you need, obviously, with yeah, some confidence. Some work is being done on that through Baz's team, through okay. the research team. So maybe, <laughs> sorry. It would be quite good just to note that too, because just given there has been some concern. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're doing it without actually being able to run that by bears. I wouldn't want to put it into yeah. a... Councillors, we've already, we've already had conversations amongst ourselves about noting everything under the sun. Uh, if we can avoid trying to do that and ending up with a comprehensive list which misses something out, uh, it's a pro probably a good idea. Councillor Wolf, final... Uh, you, Councillor Young, you had a question too, didn't you? Okay, Council Wolf. Good, uh, Brad. What, what's what's the approximate cost of the um, Thorndon Key business case? I've got another question after. Gunter, are you able to? 
around 50 million. 50 million. Um, and finally, um, could you tell us what our what council's policy is in regards to reviews? Um, I don't think we have a policy on reviews. No, we don't. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Young. I'm sorry, it's come back to me in a blind, blinding flash. Um, so just thinking about the Oh, um, but um, my question is, uh, taking... I didn't hear the first bit, hmm? I didn't hear the, I, I oh, didn't hear the first bit sorry. The, the point of Councillor Carvitz's thing is that the, um, um, whatever you call it, review is independent rather than officers. Um, but the, the other thing is, so the cost of doing a review is, so Brad, what was the figure you gave, $50,000? 50, 50, yeah, it would be in the tens of thousands. So, but we also know that the um, Thorndon Key businesses are threatening to take us to judicial review. What is the cost? What would the cost of that be to council? Um, I mean, the, I've got Beth here if she wants to, to answer. I mean, it entirely depends on how that plays out. But the idea of judicial review has been bandied about for a while. We don't give our advice um, under threat of maybe being taken to court. Um, no, it was just the kind of relative cost. You know, maybe it's sometimes better to spend a halfpenny so, rather so, than waste So, okay, I guess. Time. So, what I would add is, we're very confident that um, the traffic resolution that process that we went through was robust and would stand up uh, in a court. But I'll hand over to Beth. Uh, yep. So, a general rule of thumb for judicial reviews is at least a hundred thousand dollars in legal fees. Um, that's increasing as we, um, as the years go by. Um, but I'd also like to reiterate Moana's comments. You know, we're very comfortable from a legal perspective in relation to the um, the local government decision making processes that were undertaken in relation to that decision you made in June. Very, very confident. Councillor Fitzsimons, was it a question? No, okay, cool. Okay, councillors, uh, that's all the questions. Uh, is there anybody else who wishes to speak on this? And I'm not going to encourage you to do so. Councillor, Councillor Fitzsimons and then Panet. Yeah, look, just very briefly, I'll talk to the amendment and the substantive, but I just wanted to um, say that, you know, we made a clear and strong decision. There was comprehensive consultation. There were no flaws in the decision-making process. We've heard that it's legally robust. We need to stand by and honour the decision we made. Otherwise, the critics who say this council isn't serious and can't be trusted will be proven right. If we are to rethink this at this stage, in my view, we have no hope of implementing the visionary plans of Let's Get Rally Moving because they will be much, much more disruptive to our city. And I think this amendment, um, as a friend of mine who's a failed comedy writer said, and it's Christmas time, and despite the fact that cherries are a Christmas fruit, we shouldn't be allowing people to have another bite of the cherry because they opposed it first time round. So I'll be pleased to um, support the substantive um, and not the most of the amendments. Uh, I'm going to take Councillor Wolf next. Yeah, thank, thanks, Your Worship. Um, my reason behind supporting an independent um, review of Thorndon Key is based on Island Bay. Um, I think that, you know, and, and, and um, Councillor Day, you, you might laugh a bit, but um, members of the cycling, cycling fraternity and myself um, felt after the 27th of um, September um, 2017 that an independent review was, was, was necessary for um, Island Bay. Um, we took that to officers who, who, who refused that and we only have to see what happened, what has happened since. I believe that some form of independence in a review in, in a, a, a situation that is, is, has $50 million in it is, is more, more than um, reasonable. So I, I commend Councillor Calvert and, and Councillor Young for bringing this to the table. I think that um, it's, it's no, um, um, it, it shouldn't be a problem to, to incorporate something that is independent to give uh, us councillors um, a better basis to be able to deal with things in the future. Uh, Councillor Panett. Uh, thank you. And look, um, just to be really clear, it has been one of my top political priorities to get this cycle way through. Um, I was gutted when we 
uh, kept losing around the council table. Um, but I do just want to say that I do have some relationships with the Thornton business community that I would like to maintain to keep some open dialogue. Um, and, you know, because as chair of the planning committee is, is one of the ward councillors. Um, so... No, no, it's not. It's not. It's not about that. It's, it is, and it is just. It is just about relationships. So, um, look, I, I'm, I'm appreciative um, that um, that uh, the mayor accepted just my suggestion about just acknowledging that further action will actually be taken. That that does help, and I appreciate the uh, response of the officers just saying that actually some work is being done on the economic impact. So I think that will be helpful to feed into the process. I'm happy to. So I so I won't on balance support for um, given some of that work's going to be done, and it's very very expensive, um, and saying that I do understand why people want independent um, uh, responses. Uh, but strongly support five, um, we just need to keep talking because we're going to have a lot of parking removed around the city, um, and um, clearly hearts and minds have not been won. And this is really about trust and confidence. It's not about the data and whether it's right. I'm sure the officers have got it right. It's about whether people have confidence in our um, decision-making process. So I think um, some of these are really helpful and I look forward to seeing more data. Councillor Day. Um, well, I um, will speak to both sub substantive and the amendment. I just want to say um, I'm really pleased to see um, the comprehensive advice from officers based on the information that has been um, gathered from our, our data sources. Um, I also just want to remind us of the people we had come to talk to us about this when we made the decision last time. Um, they were very clear on why we needed to make these changes around safety um, and I definitely um, think we need to remember that that was in there. Um, obviously we heard from Patrick this morning which was very helpful to remind us of um, the community behind this. Um, and I do think it's really important to remember that this isn't just about a cycle way. We're heading into a process where we really are going to be talking about placemaking and making sure that this is an area that works for more than just um, people arriving by vehicle. Um, so I do cycle along this road um, and the change is amazing. Um, it's really good to know that I don't need to rush in in the morning to get in before the, so the clearway change because once the clearway changes, it's um, it's uh, being doored by a car territory, um, which is always a bit um, nerve-wracking. And now the cycle home um, doesn't have that same threat every day, so it, it has made a huge difference. And actually, when it's at the peak times with cycling, it is really busy. There are multiple cyclists trying to navigate the space together, and um, having a little bit more space is really helpful. And the numbers are going up. Um, and also, I do shop um, along that space and have so from my bike, as I've said before, so I think it's important people remember that people do jump off their bike. In fact, I'm more likely to jump off my bike than have to find a car park. Um, I just also want to um, acknowledge that the substantive does um, communicate that the work will be continuing and that there will be many conversations um, with um, council staff and the community. And so I don't, I think the amended substantive has actually captured a lot of, um, of what maybe Councillor Calvert was trying to achieve. Um, I do feel that number five is kind of stating the obvious um, and I think that the mover um, is often the first one to tell us when we're doing that. So um, yeah, I think probably at this stage I don't really need to support that because it's already happening and I'm really comfortable with that. Um, and yeah, we just don't need number four. I think that that's, that's spending money that won't tell us anything that we don't know. And I think we just need to get on and make sure that Let's Get Wellington Moving can make the, the fantastic changes that it will make to make this a really great workable space. And actually, thank you, Councillor Condi, for highlighting that the community can come to us with suggestions around timing and making these parks more and more accessible. So, kia ora. Councillor Condi. Thank you. Um, I just want to up. note that I guess I'm concerned that we're conflating two different processes here that admittedly happened yeah, at the right. same time. Mm. But the Let's Get Wellington Moving process is quite separate from the traffic resolution process that we went through to change angle parking to parallel parking. So, Councillor Wolf, when you ask, you know, what's the cost of the business case for Thorn and Key and Hut Road, and we hear that it's $50 million, um, I would just like to note that, in fact, Let's Get Wellington Moving has already had an independent review. We had a health check because we were concerned about some of the, the issues that we had around consultation. And that independent review looked specifically at consultation and how we could do better. And those, um, those recommendations that came out of those, that review have been implemented. Now, as we all know, these things don't change overnight. And we're on a journey with Let's Get Wellington Moving. And they're committed to that journey of improving our consultation processes. But I really think it's important that we don't conflate those 
those conversations around Let's Get Wellington moving and the long-term issues around placemaking, which is all still to come, with a very small traffic resolution process that probably did, in fact, cost less than $50,000 to do, mm. um, and, and that, that we need to be clear about that. I also, you know, want to say that if we... if I have no question about the data or any of the data that's available to us. Any data that's available to us, an independent review is not going to have more data than we have available to us. And to be honest, I, I do find it concerning the suggestions that we've had from um, members of the public that our staff's integrity cannot be trusted and that this recommendation plays into that narrative. Um, I reject that wholeheartedly. I, I thank our staff for all the work that they, they, that they do and the integrity that they bring to every single one of these processes. And I am very confident um, that this traffic resolution process met all of our legal requirements. And I do hope that the retailers don't decide to go down a path of judicial review because I'm, I'm concerned that at a time when they're already struggling that that would be genuinely a waste of their money. So I hope that as we move forward, particularly with the Let's Get Wellington moving conversations, that we can get on board with how are we going to make this change happen in the city? How are we going to make the space work for the retailers and the people moving through it? And that's a conversation that is all yet to come and I really look forward to us all participating in. Thank you. That's three speakers in the same direction. Anyone else? Well, there's nobody else on the speaking list anyway. Councillor. So, Councillor, you're going to speak. I'm not encouraging you to. We've got. I just uh, want can, to can I just? Can I just? All of you. Can I just yeah. bear in mind? We've got a lot of papers. This is not even a paper. We've got to do something about how we deal with petitions, and this is not the way to deal with it. Well, I'll be very brief. Um, so we. We made a decision very recently. I didn't support it, but nevertheless, it was made democratically. Uh, I haven't really heard enough today for me to think that uh, we should go off and try and find evidence to support this th that decision has been wrong. A lot of what we did here was known uh, or likely to be of known. So although I am very sympathetic to the uh, retailers in Thorndon Quay, I did my best at the last debate. And, uh, and unfortunately, I was unsuccessful. Uh, I, don't th I think I'm going to have to run with the majority and I'll support the substantive but not the amendments. Uh, thanks, Councillor. That was, that's now the fourth sp person speaking in that direction. So, <laughs> Councillor Cowell, right of reply. Vote after right of reply. Right of reply. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, lots of things. Yeah, look, um, I, I, I can understand that a review of this type, 50,000, say, top end, or maybe a bit less, but we're spending 50 billion, oh, sorry, $50 million on this going forward. So um, it, it's a drop in the bucket, and actually what it will do is help inform a better process. And look, yeah, I mean, I actually agree that, you know, Number five might just be no stating the obvious, but stating the obvious is, is would be fine, but it hasn't been done in the past in terms of the engagement hasn't happened. We've said the engagement will happen well. It hasn't happened. We've seen it in the past 12 months on the Golden Mile, um, even though uh, 18 months ago they said we would do it much better, and then the engagement this year didn't happen with Let's Get Welly Moving. The same with Thorndon Key. It didn't happen earlier this year either. So yes, I am stating the obvious because the obvious has been ignored. Um, and so I want to make sure that this does happen. Um, and, um, and thank you, Councillor Wolf, for mentioning Island Bay. Island Bay, we passed that decision in 2017. We said we put $6 million in. We, we were debating about it had gone up to $14 million this year because of the issues, the delays, for whatever reason. And one of them was a, um, a judicial review. And that's four years later. So just trying to make sure that we, um, we don't end up in that situation again by just spending, you know, I think um, Councillor Young said something about spending a penny, be, um, something like that, before or money before anything major. Um, and yeah, thank you, Councillor Fitzsimons. I will do my best not to overeat on Councils. the cherries. Um, so um, over Christmas and um, yeah, and look, this is about placemaking, but we do need the information to be able to feed back into the next stage. So this is not reversing any decision, but it's making sure that we have good, like everyone said, good information, but broad information, not just about parking. It's actually about all the other stuff as well and about the people in that space, because it is about people. So look, I ask you to um, support this. And yes, the health check was done last, the health check was actually done last year. And since then, we've had further engagements, and they haven't worked. There's been weaknesses that 
officers have actually identified and agreed. So, um, so I think it's really important. And, and there's a comment about staff integrity. Can I just ask you also to think about the integrity of the community have come and spoken to us. 1,100 people have signed a petition. You know, we should not ignore that. So they're asking, this is going somewhere, it's not reversing it, but what it's saying is let's learn from what's happened, put it forward, and see that we can get a better solution going forward, because this will be really useful, not just for this, because this will be useful for any other changes that we want to make, and it will make a bit of time up front, will make it much better and smoother in the long term. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Um, I'm going to put the two of them separately, um, because I definitely heard that uh, there, so we'll vote first of all on four. Yes, we'll vote on four first and then we'll vote on five, okay? So, this is number four. Can we have a division as well, please? Oh, well, it's council. Councillor, you've been here for a while, it's a council. Every vote is recorded. Oh. Okay, good. I can't remember that particular part of the standing orders. Thank you. For well, I hope you'd have read the minutes because you've, um, yeah, anyway. Yep. <laughs> The minutes haven't been produced yet, um, Mayor. Councillor, that is. That was carried and it was not all. Oh, it's lost. <laughs> I was going to say. Three votes. I was going to say, yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, can I just say to you, councillors, before we put the second one, when we approve the minutes, which we do every time, you will see that the votes are all recorded at the council meetings. Every time. Vote on number five. Oh. Yeah, that wasn't oh. helpful. Yeah, which one are we going to cast? <laughs> Look. I am going to cast, oh, I can't do it, I can't use this. I'm actually going to cast against because it wasn't part of the substantive. So, it was essentially to maintain the status quo. So even though I'm voting against myself. Okay, right. Uh, that's that's a headline. Expect. That will go down well. Anybody else on the substantive? No. Um, councillors, I have no intention of speaking on the substantive either, so we'll put that one. Okay? And nobody wants to take anything separately there? No? Okay. Yeah, that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay, counts, councillors. Um, that takes us to th the first actual paper on the agenda. I'm so, um, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Leslie Brown, uh, I'm going to ask Leslie Brown to come to the table uh, representing Taranaki Whanui. Now effectively, this is something I think we ought to tweak in our standing orders that we've actually got effectively people who are not part of the council organisation who are effectively part of the paper. And I'm also going to ask, uh, is it, who else is here? Ella and Thamwe to come up as well, please. Yeah, so we've got the three of you there. So anything needs to be said. The paper is all there. Um, we've, 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 we've got the paper. It's very clear. But is there anything you need to add? My sincere apologies. I all need to go. Uh, kia ora. Uh, ko Leslie Brown, Taku and Goa. Um, hello all. I'm Leslie Brown, representing Taranaki Whanui, and in particular the descendants of the people of Tiaro Pa. Uh, for some time now, we've been uh, able to be partners in the development of a new playground at what's been called Frank Kitts Park. Part of that is that we've been given the opportunity to present a name. We've opted not for a direct translation of playground, but instead offer for your consideration Tiara Mahana. Tiara for the location, Mahana in the sense of warmth of relighting the fires of our occupation as we welcome to the playground visitors from wherever they come in the city. So ne katoa i te rangi i te whenua, no ono hoki e ne katapia, a ne e matu. Acknowledging our supreme being, we offer what we have to give in the hope that it pleases and is agreeable. Thank you. Kia ora. My family or Ella, is there anything you want to say? Uh, yeah, kia ora. Uh, thank you for the, the opportunity to present this paper to the 
Council. Um, I just wanted to add that it's not a renaming of the play area. It is um, currently doesn't have a name, and it's that's for later. Um, and that the actual naming of this park will happen if it is approved will happen at the name naming ceremony with Taranaki Whanui and not at this council meeting and Mana Whenua have been really clear about that um, and the other thing I just want to add is if you do have questions if it's anything other than about the naming of the park then we might not be able to answer anything broadly about Frankett's Park. Thank you. And Ella, if I can tell you, there are going to be no questions of anything related to Frank Kitts Park more broadly because that is not the subject of the paper, <laughs> and I'm not going to allow them. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions about the name? Councillor Young. Could it be extended to cover the whole of Frank Kitts Park? <laughs> not looking at that at them. That's very, very clear. Um, Councillor Day, I'm going to invite you to introduce the paper. Uh, kia ora, uh, ngā mahi mai o haa ki te whānau o te aro pā, i tēnei taonga te ingoa, te aro mahana, uh, tēnā koe Leslie hoki. Uh, so I just really want to acknowledge the whānau of te aro pā, as um, Leslie mentioned, who have um, gift, or are gifting this name. Um, it's a beautiful name and I think it is entirely appropriate that we don't just name every playground playground. So um, <laughs> I think it's fantastic that um, you've come up with um, a name which helps us connect with te aro pā and continues to remind us um, of the important taonga that we have in this city. So thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to speak for long because as we know that um, the co-papa of this paper is very very narrow, um, but also um, I do just want to acknowledge the work that the staff have done on this naming um, to work with um, Taranaki Whanui and the work that is happening around making sure that this playground is getting underway. It's exciting to think that we'll be opening something next year for the Tamariki in Wellington. Um, Yes, and I also do just want to acknowledge um, Pekaira, who has um, worked with Council now for a couple of years on this um, playground and has made many good suggestions as to how this um, playground can um, honour and, and uplift Te Reo Māori and also um, the, uh, I guess, her tūpuna and making sure that we, um, we, you know, we're celebrating um, the important things in this city. Um, do just want to also reiterate the fact that we are not um, celebrate. We're not. We're not making a big thing about this name until September, until it's open, because that is the correct and appropriate time to really make sure that this name is uplifted. But obviously, we have to go through a formal process where, um, you know, where we agree to it, and it means that this project also now has. Um, it starts to um, have much stronger connection with. Um, with, uh, with iwi and also with um, Māori. And so I, I was excited to read um, that there's going to be um, some work done on how we can incorporate Māori games. And so I think it's really important that this name is well connected. So thank you very much. Very happy to move this paper and look forward to um, playing on the playground when it opens. <laughs> Kia ora. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Young, would you like to second? <laughs> okay, anybody else wish to speak? No? Well, in that case, we can put the... Put the resolution. And Leslie, again, thank you. And thanks, Ella. Thanks, my family. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That takes us to Takina. And Barbara is going to, um, this is one of those ones where we haven't got the relevant officer. Oh, oh we have got, oh, Danny is here. Yeah, um, but but Barbara, Barbara wants to yeah, introduce um, it. Danny, yes, I think you might come up as well. Yeah, thank yep. you. Um, through you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to make some preliminary comments, um, but, but Danny will certainly be able to answer your questions of detail. Um, and talking about Takina, I thought it was worth um, quickly just acknowledging um, that the project itself is uh, well on track, um, thanks to Danny's leadership and his team. Um, but a another exciting um, event today is that we are, I think, the first council in New Zealand to make use of the uh, new green financing um, provided by uh, the local government financing agency with the, the first tranche of funds being um, issued to us today. So um, Wellington's leading the way there. And, and in fact, I might also just mention that um, the LGFA's decision to enter into this form of financing was strongly at the encouragement of Wellington City Council. So, um, look, my, my comment here about um, the uh, proposal before you um, 
in terms of a, an exhibition panel has been at um, my suggestion. I know as the chief executive, I quite often like the delegated authority to make many decisions um, <laughs> myself. Sometimes we like that too. <laughs> yeah, but the, the reason I have suggested this, um, this collaborative approach is that we are with Takina entering into a different kind of risk-taking activity in that um, the ambition for the exhibitions program is, is to be able to deliver blockbuster exhibitions to the city, exhibitions that are major events in their own right that attract significant numbers of uh, visitors um, to the city as well as um, great participation locally. And it means that we are procuring exhibitions that can um, at times cost up to two or three million dollars. And that a strong business case needs to go with the um, decision to enter into one of those events. Um, and of course robust and good uh, business cases will be undertaken. But given the council in this situation is actually becoming the direct promoter of an event and you're taking the risk of investment up front on the basis that you will be charging for entry um, in many cases and anticipating some return on your investment and the challenge will be that over time we would be aiming to build um, a fund within um, Takina activity itself that can help um, feed um, future investment. But you haven't set up an upfront um, thing called a Takina Exhibitions Fund from which we draw down um, and minimise our risk. And so that's why I believe it would be good practice in this case for um, a level of go governance involvement in the assessment of the business cases in the same way that the board of Te Papa would be involved in assessing the risks of their blockbuster exhibitions. So that's my reasoning behind this. I'll hand over any further comment to Danny. Thanks, Danny. Is there anything you want to add? No, look, I think that's a very good summary. So happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. Oh, okay, it's questions. Uh, Councillor Condi, Panit. Thank you. I just have some questions about how the, the financials are going to work. So the, one of the suggestions is that um, if an exhibition makes a profit, then that will go back into the city growth fund. And I guess my question is why wouldn't we use that to pay off the cost of Takina sooner? Yeah, and, and so, so I suppose um, we're looking at quite a long game for Takina exhibitions and in terms of um, uh, blockbusters, initially we'll be looking to source blockbusters from, from the market, so existing product that's out there. Long term we want Takina to also be the, the um, developer and the actual promoter of Wellington talent, so working with the likes of Weta to develop product that we can then show at, at Takina and then showcase those and take those, so we almost become a provider of product as well as, as just a displayer of product. Now, in, in terms of that, as we go through and um, uh, build up any surplus from Takina, then your, your choices are you let that build up to then become the, the fund that helps fund the future development of exhibitions, or, or you pay down debt um, or rates, um, and, and then you come back for request for funding for that. So, so one provides a sort of a self-funding type thing that allows the exhibitions to grow, and, and the others would, would basically say, well, you're, you're a little bit, um, you have the plans, but not the means of delivering the plans. Um, thank you. And then I guess in the event of a loss, would next year's city growth fund be reduced and would that mean we would have less funding available for city activation that would normally happen through the city growth fund? Yeah, and, and the, the, the history of the city growth fund is, is that it's got reserves and it's always had reserves. Um, so if we looked at it today, it's got quite a healthy reserve position. So, so effectively that is just looking at it saying, well, how would you deal with the backstop if, if there was an event that for whatever reason, um, and you can see through the city growth report that's coming to you later that, that COVID can happen impact, certain externalities can have an impact where all best will in the world, the exhibition's well planned, the business case is strong, but, but for whatever reason the, the circumstances. So, so it provides that, that ability to sort of balance that risk. Final question. Um, I was just then wondering, you know, um, our Chief Executive talked about possibly having a Tarkina exhibition fund, which isn't proposed. So I guess, are we comfortable with the idea that the, tar the risk for the Tarkina event sits within the City Growth Fund, which is also carrying risks for other major events? Yeah, and, and, and I, th I think 
some of that will go back to, Barbara's absolutely right, that each of these will have a, um, its profile in terms of what its risk profile looks like. And, and the quality of the business case is, is going to be key in terms of making sure that, that we have done as much through the commercial negotiations, through the product assessment, through the, the audience acceptance, through the pricing of the, the ticketing, to make sure those risks are, are, are minimised and, and that, that done well, this programme should basically help pay a contribution towards the running costs of Tekina and, and help develop that sort of fighting fund and the city growth fund. Um, developing another fund, I, I don't see any advantage in, in having another reserve fund. So that's all right. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Pannett. Thank you for your work on this. Um, look, I do have some concerns about it. So. Um, what, there's no legal liability on the council if there's a fail, or councillors in particular? Um, so how does it sort of work? So we lose money, uh, if we don't have the reserves, then we um, have to rate for it? Yeah, it, it wouldn't be something you would have to rate for because it would be retrospective. It would be that you'd effectively report a deficit in the financial year that it's, right. that it's related to. Um, in terms of councillor liability, there would be no councillor liability to that. Political, political. Um, yeah. And, yeah, look, I guess just my um, concern is around maintaining the division between operations and governance, and usually I'm quite protective around our governance role, but I think it should flow both ways. Um, would you um, object to a couple of externals being um, appointed uh, my my just my view is that I think we need more expertise. You know, um, this is not in any way to question the judgment and the skills of people who are being appointed. But this is a this is an ongoing arrangement. So, yeah, yeah I just think with people who have got the um, who actually work in this area. Yep, and and so in terms of the operating and management agreement we have with Tapapa. Te Papa are actively involved in the development of the exhibition program and the business cases that come to council. So, so in that you actually have the most expert exhibition provider um, assessor in the country. Um, so we, we're already drawing on effectively the best in the business to develop our business cases, negotiate and source product. Um, and then in, in terms of Wellington, Wellington NZ in terms of the major event programme are almost then the next biggest player in, the, in, this, in this market. And, and through that connection with John Allen coming on the panel as the chief executive of Wellington NZ, we're then basically tying in that expertise as well. So, so I, I think Councillor Pannett, it has been thought about. Um, and in terms of that, I think we've got a, the expertise in the actual development of the proposals to make sure they are robust and strong, and then uh, the expertise within the panel to do that. But would you object to an independent person? We appoint independent people all the time to committees. It's just, I see there's quite a lot of risk in this. I don't think it's just relating to COVID. It, you know, these things can go wrong. So. You know, would it would it be helpful to have some outside people with you know different layers of expertise and in, in conventions and uh, events, whatever? Yeah, and and my my response is I don't see the value added to that myself, um, but that that's my view. Councillor Rush. Yeah, thanks, Danny, and maybe Barbara. I, I'm very concerned about this um, exhibition panel. Um, particularly after what you've just said about the, you know, the expertise to Papa, Wellington, New Zealand, all I can see is that these, the addition of these politicians will mean that politicians will block um, exhibitions that um, they don't feel are politically correct for them. Is that is that a real danger? I'm trying to understand what the. Can I please a point of order, Councillor Day? I'm speaking. Can you please be quiet? Councillor Rush, fair enough. No, 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 no. Councillor Rush, carry on. You get the gist of my I did. Yeah. I understand. Yep, yep. Um, and, and so, sorry, sorry uh, Danny, I think um, the Chief Executive is going to oh, um, okay. assist with that one. Thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I understand um, the question. The, uh, the first point I would make is um, the risks of the exhibitions program in Tarkina sits solely with the Council. So the Council does need to be um, the decision maker because um, you carry the risk for the program. I totally. Um, uh, agree that we have um, the expertise feeding into the uh, robust business case work 
um, with the benefit of working um, in close partnership with Te Papa. But I think the third point is um, this is about governance responsibility and I think there should be a form of governance involvement in these decisions and that I would have confidence that um, the panel approach would work well because my experience of it um, with the panels I sit on now with elected members in terms of, um, uh, for example, the uh, Decade of Culture Fund and decisions for um, that, the City um, Growth Fund and um, also the major events panel I sit on with other representatives. Um, I've, what I have seen is a, a, you know, a respectful and thoughtful approach um, f which is well informed by a good quality business case and in the end the key is the quality of the business case and that needs to stand. Danny, I'm happy for you to add. Um, look, I, I share your experience. The City Growth Fund worked on since its inception and that, that interface between officer delegation and political oversight ha has worked very well and I can't think of an instance where, Sean, there's been a sort of a, a, a personal perspective overlaid onto a, a proposal that, that stopped it from happening. So. So I, I think it's probably a, a, a perspective that may happen, but I haven't seen it, I haven't witnessed it, and, and I think the panel we've got here, uh, essentially the, 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 the connection we're trying to make is, is that the, the wider council develop an exhibition centre and program sitting at Tekina, it was really to drive economic activity within the city. So, so the, the member of the panel that comes through from the social, cultural um, and economic is, is there basically because that's the, the guardian of that. Uh, then, then there's a performance aspect, so we're bringing through the, the chair of the finance performance and then a whole of council perspective with um, the mayor and then we've got Barbara from an executive and John Allen from an expert perspective. So we've got a, a good balance of, of people there for a, a, specific, a specific purpose. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Cowart. Um, just a question, um, are we getting any funding from government? Because I noticed that they're funding and operating um, um, for the new Christchurch one that's also due to open shortly. Um, so, so Christchurch is, is a convention centre, not a, not a commercial exhibition, so it doesn't have that aspect. Um, yep. Christchurch is totally funded by, by the Crown, um, right. that's always been the case. Okay. Um, in terms of are we getting funding, uh, I know that we've got two exhibitions that we're, we're in advanced discussions with, and the second one we have Crown funding through the, the regional event panel for that. Um, for that exhibition if it goes ahead. Um, so, so in terms of that, there will be a case-by-case -case approach to where Crown have funds that are accessible for um, major event, event right. type But, but it's events-based, so we haven't had any funding from government for our conventions for the, not, not exhibition, no. unlike Auckland or Christchurch. Uh, Auckland got poker licences, Christchurch got cash. So. Mm, okay, thank you. Okay, right, I'm going to introduce the paper then. Um, so, by starting off, I'm going to say, as I said in the mural announcement, Takina has, uh, this has been a year of a lot of achievements uh, in respect of Takina. Obviously, we can see the building taking shape, rain, reindeer and all, um, and it is looking absolutely stunning, and I think that's a reflection, I think all the councillors uh, and management who are around the table at the time when we made the decision that we wanted an iconic building as opposed to something that was merely um, you know, ordinary, I think that it is looking fantastic. So uh, that is really marvellous. And, and and I think it's it's great to see um, LTs, the work that they're doing is, is fantastic as well, LT McGuinness. Um, we've also this year entered into that exciting partnership with Te Papa. Now, I, the reason that's particularly important here, and Danny's already highlighted, it's not only do they have, uh, they, I think they're the second biggest operator of conventions uh, in New Zealand at the moment. Uh, they are also um, uh, obviously very experienced in the delivery of, um, of uh, catering, etc. But they're also the number one operator in, in this country in terms of exhibitions. And that is not only just attracting exhibitions, uh, curating exhibitions, but also creating exhibitions and touring exhibitions. And so the point that Danny makes about having um, a business case, the business case cannot come to us without Te Papa being donkey deep involved in it. And I think that's really, really important. It's interesting just reflecting on the discussion that we just had about um, Thorn and Key 
and the aspiration for, for some for saying, well, let's let's have a, a review of what we've got all those expertise that all that expertise in house. Now, who's going to do a review for this one? Who's going to have more expertise than the combination of Tapapa and Wellick and NZ? And I'm going to. I think what you're hearing from Danny is, I think you'd struggle. So you might want to put somebody else th uh, there, but the question is the value add and the cost of uh, the cost of doing that. Um, I think the, the bit that we've got to face up to here, councillors, is that exhibitions and how we manage those exhibitions is always a part of this proposition right from the word go. So now we are simply saying, how do we manage those exhibitions? How do we make the decision about which exhibitions go tick and which exhibitions go cross? And Councillor Rush, can I say that from my perspective, there would never be anything about, oh, I like that one or I don't like that one or this one's politically correct or not politically correct or whatever. This is about the business of those what is, you know, what is the business case? What is the attraction which is going to, you know, how many people are going to come through the door, or do we expect to come through the door, to be able to pay the cost of putting these exhibitions together? Because they are, they're, they're significant costs. So let's, let's not beat around the bush. There are risks in this. The biggest, the easiest way of dealing with those risks is to say, we're not going to have any exhibitions. Well, what a waste of time that will be. What a silly decision that will be. So we, we've set up a convention and exhibition centre. Why have we got the, the exhibitions there? It will be an attraction to Wellington. It will be an attraction for Wellingtonians and it will be an attraction for people coming to Wellington. That's what we do it for. That's why we support at the moment. We are supporting, goodness me, an exhibition called Hilmer F. Clint. We are supporting and just support an exhibition called The Surrealists. That is one of the things that we do. Those are not without risk. Every time they are not without risk. And in fact, we know that there are some of those risks, you know, that in the COVID environment that we will face. You know, the Surrealists obviously was affected by COVID. Some of the other exhibitions have been affected by COVID. That is what we do. But what the, the purpose here is to try and work out what is the best way of actually saying yes to that one or no to that one. And I think that what Barbara and Danny have come up with is that balance between trying to make sure we've got the, the expertise there We've got a bit of governance oversight and councillors, let's not beat around the bush. If we said we are going to back away and we're going to let management deal with this um, and we're not going to have anything to say with it, when one goes wrong, if one goes wrong, do you think that we will be able to run away and hide from that and say, oh, we had nothing to do with that? You delegated it to management and you said that management will make all the decisions around that and if it goes wrong, yeah, a lot of us are on the hook for that. So in a sense, I suppose, whichever way we do this, we're all in a sense on the hook, but at least you, you're putting three, three of your members up uh, saying that you are, you've got to oversee it. But we have to do that all the time. We had a conversation this morning about one particular um, substantial event in this, or, in this city. It's not quite in the same vein, but there are risks associated with that. Every single event that we have at the moment has a risk around COVID, every one of them. And we've had to pay out in some of those. We know we've had to pay out in some of those. With the, you know, we've, we've had WOW, for example. But we back that one collectively. So this really is the judgment call between something which is just the chief executive, maybe in, in consultation with the uh, with um, uh, John Allen from uh, Wellington NZ and advice from Tapapa. And Barbara is quite clearly saying, I don't want to do that on my own. I think that this is appropriate not to. And if you think that it's appropriate for Barbara to do these ones, which are potentially running into, you know, say a couple of million dollars, then please, councillors, all the little dinky ones that we already deal with through our grants, et cetera, committee. Can you give them all to management? <laughs> Would you want to do that? Because if that's what you want to do for this one, you should give them all to management because they are more operational than these ones are. And I, I see Fleur going, <laughs> no, and you're right. We don't delegate some of those things because there is a governance involvement in those things. And I think that, that we've got the appropriate balance. Putting it around the whole council table, A, that's clunky, we know that, and B, we're much improved, but there are occasions when things would slip out, and we don't want to do that either, because these things are going to be really significantly commercially confidential, and we must maintain those commercial confidentialities. So I think they've struck the balance about right, um, and I, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating whichever way we, um, we devour this, but we are going to have to take some risks, but the rewards are, I think, significant as well. And actually, if I can, um, I would like to just add a little uh, bit on the end of that. Um, and that, uh, it's, it's really, it says it there already uh, in four, but I think we want to be really crystal clear. I would like to see us keep an ongoing record of what hopefully will be, hey, we made some money there, and we made some money there, and we made some money there, and gosh, this is looking quite good, and actually we're, you know, so that we're actually keeping a record of that. Some might not make that money. 
but, but at least we're keeping a, re a track record that is crystal clear that we can say to our community, hey, over the last three, four, five years, if these <coughs> exhibitions have made you know, $1.75 million or whatever the number might be over that period of time, or they've made 1.5 or they've made 4.0 or whatever. Um, we should have a crystal clear um, uh, analysis of that. So I'm just going to add that we agree that Council will maintain an ongoing record of the financial outcomes from exhibitions. So we're just quite crystal clear. Because I want to make sure, and, and it, I, I, what I can tell you is that if I think there's a real risk around something, I will certainly be going, are you sure we've got this one right? We want to make sure that it, this one's not too marginal. And so, but, you know, we can't absolve ourselves completely from risk. But I'm very, very much attuned to making sure that we try and get the right ones and not go down the track where we're going to be losing lots of money. So I'm moving second by Councillor Cowart. Just very briefly. Um, yeah, look, I just really um, support this. Um, just, you know, with our CCOs, they're all, they all have boards and they're all dealing with a similar type of thing as well with various exhibitions or shows and like the Mayor referred, you know, Experience Wellington had something similar, I'm sure. The Stadium and Basin Reserve have events like um, Councillor Rush, you were on. So um, we, we're dealing with that all the time in this sort of very similar format. Um, I think um, using our city growth fund as a bit of a backstop is, is prudent because that does support some of the work of our other CCOs um, and I just think we should be celebrating that this is one massive project um, that is pretty much on time is going to open um, and ha has not had any sort of major hasn't landed on the front page in a bad way um, and, um, and, and and all credit to um, Danny McComb um, you know with that strong fiscal um, management that I know that you're behind it. <laughs> but, uh, music to my ears of those words. Um, but yeah, look, thank you, thank you so much for that um, because we wouldn't be here. And, and and I think it's even stronger because we actually haven't had any government money on this, um, and so we've done it ourselves. So I think even more so. And, and going forward, we will do it ourselves, as as in many things that we do. So look, thank you and thank you, Danny. But yes, fully support this. Thanks, Councillor Cowart. Uh, Councillor Rush. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So just to say, guys, I, I've allayed my concerns. Uh, Councillor Calvert hit, hit it on the nail on the head um, as I was comparing uh, the structure to the stadium, and I realised, well, the stadium's got that trust structure and there's nothing actually that's comparable. So I am going to support... I would encourage, perhaps, in terms of reference... Um, references so that there is that sort of structure, but otherwise I'm okay. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Rush. Anyone else? Uh, Councillor Panett and then Councillor O'Neill. Um, thanks for the uh, responses to questions. Um, look, I'm going to vote for this, but I do have concerns, and I, I, for me they weren't entirely allayed. Um, I think it is appropriate to have councillors uh, there um, as public representatives, as, uh, you know, to give a good uh, sniff test. Um, but I do, th and, and for the wise use of ratepayer funds, but I do think this would benefit from some independent um, advice. And um, I, look, I'm sensing there's probably not a support around the table to support that, but so I'm not going to put it up. But I think that would have been sensible. We do this all the time when we have a CCO. We put um, externals on. We've got an external chairing our audit and risk committee. And for me, there is significant risk here. Um, and... You know, sometimes we do need to take things also out of out of the political realm a little bit. You know, we are here as politicians, so sometimes that might get a little bit tricky. Um, so I guess I am interested that, you know, we have lots of issues over resource concerns where we're not allowed to have any say, but when it comes to taking some quite significant risk, um, then councillors have a role. So... I think that's obviously for the new council to again to look at the delegations and to decide what's appropriate. Um, so the advice will need to be very, very robust because people will be in the gun if it goes wrong. Um, and certainly if um, this continues over to the next trainium, then anyone taking on these roles, I think, um, does need to be made very clear to them um, that this will be the role and that, the, you know, there may be some uh, challenges ahead for them. Councillor Panic, Councillor, that is three. Yes, that is three. I will do that. Um, does anybody else wish to speak? Councillor, I need this is set back again. So no. Okay. Does anybody wish to speak against? 
It's only two, actually. No, she's eight, she, I, think she's eight, I think she's okay. Look, um, councillors, I will um, just exercise right of, uh, just brief right of reply. Uh, Councillor Calvert, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you also for your acknowledgement of Danny. Um, uh, we, we did acknowledge Danny thoroughly um, when we did the Te Papa deal as well, which uh, he and, um, uh, and Ian did a fantastic job between the two parties. Um, and so again, Danny, thank you for all your work, your ongoing work on, on uh, uh, Taikina um, is, is really, really appreciated. And you're right, um, Councillor Calvert also, it will be very, very nice to see our government actually invest something significant in Wellington somewhere uh, at some stage would be very, <laughs> would be profoundly nice. Um, uh, in terms of, Councillor Rush, yeah, in terms of reference and the way we work, yeah, sure, we would, you know, we'll make sure that we, we do that. There's a clear way of doing that for the existing uh, grants processes, so um, we can do that without any difficulty. Uh, and Councillor Panett, um, I think your main point really was, uh, although I was intrigued that you wanted to take things out of the political realm, there are things I would definitely like to take out of the political realm, which you may not appreciate. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, but the, the point of having that independent advice, I think the advice we've had, the clear advice which we've had and answers from both um, the chief executive and from Danny is that there will be plenty of advice around uh, around these um, from basically the best in the game, uh, and I think for me that's enough. Look, if if looking at a business case, um, we think that hey, we we don't have enough there. We've got more questions. I bet your bottom dollar will ask will be asking those those uh, extra questions, uh, and that really is all I needed to respond to. So, councillors, let's vote. Okay, councillors, we're going to take a break at half past. Um, I don't think we're quite going to finish by then, but uh, you know, it was always a, always a, a hope. Um, City Recovery Fund. Um, so, Stephen, welcome. Stephen, is there anything you wanted to say? This is basically just a regular report which has ended up on this table. Sure, and uh, I think Kerry might be online too, so um, she got caught up in the no, no, closure. No, apparently not. She's no longer here? Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, Danny um, and Dion is here, so that um, if, if there are any questions. But look, I just really wanted to say that um, you'll remember that the City Recovery Fund was uh, introduced as part of the pandemic response plan a long time ago now, but April 2020, and uh, was formalised in the 2021 uh, annual plan. I think um, if you look at it, it's um, been overall a very successful program of activity over a really challenging year and has um, supported our struggling sectors. The um, couple of points, it wasn't um, new money, it was a combination of the existing funds, the City Growth Fund, Capital of Culture and Destination Wellington. Uh, obviously the council agreed the framework uh, for the decision making. and. Um, that, that guided the um, decisions within a, a series of um, delegations. Obviously, um, at the time, councillors required support to our arts and culture sector to be maintained, and uh, you'll see that 60% of the money uh, went there. So, look, that's probably all I really want to say. Um, the, there's quite a lot of detail in the um, appendix of where all the money went, um, and we'll do our best to answer questions. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, questions, uh, Councillor Calvert. Yeah, look, it might be in there, but I couldn't see it. Um, but just in terms of where the actual, where the funds come want to come from to go into the city growth fund, is that mainly um, from a um, bigger proportion from our commercial ratepayers in the downtown levy? Yeah, and, and I can't give you the exact proportion, no, but, but it's principally business rates as the main contributor. Yeah, Councillor, it also varies. It varies depending on which the fund was, the the original fund. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 it is generally coming from business rates. Yeah, a big proportion. Yeah. But okay. Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Councillor Panet. The Phoenix. <laughs> Really? Sorry. Do we still have to keep funding them? Um, I, I suppose rather than, than looking at the Phoenix, I, I suppose Council's had an ongoing relationship with all of the professional sports codes in, in Wellington, be it the Hurricanes, uh, the Poles, the Saints. Um, so effectively that is the ongoing support for, for those sports organisations and, and I think all of them were particularly affected through COVID. Anything else, councillors? 
No? Okay, look, I'll just say a few, a few words in introdu introducing this. Um, the one thing I, I do have in mind is whether, in fact, we should, and I have actually asked Barbara about this, uh, uh, whether, in fact, we should maintain one fund rather than having three separate funds and what's the best and most efficient way of, uh, uh, of, of doing business, but that's a decision for another day. Look, I just really want to say, if you look through this, you look at a, a you know, we've had a, some events which haven't happened um, in the last few months, um, but we have, over this period of time, run, supported and actually run directly a, a huge suite of events. Now, I don't know if there's any other city I'm going to say possibly in the world, which would have been in the fortunate position that we have been in, and have taken that bull by the horns and actually run. Welcome, Kerry. <laughs> uh, and been able to run so many events in our city. And that has been so important for our arts, culture sector. It's been so important for our hospitality and retail sectors and, and drawing people into the city. Those are the things that we do to, pro to provide, you know, bring life and vitality uh, to our city. And I think you look at that list and say, actually, collectively, we have done something really good working with our community to deliver some, some wonderful experiences uh, to our people. Um, because it was raised, um, or actually, no, the other thing I was going to say is that um, in this period of time, we have also been in a position where we have supported brand new events. I mean, City is a theatre. Uh, brand new event, a uh, really creative way of, of bringing the arts culture sector over a period of time uh, to deliver events across and surprises across our city. Um, eat, drink, play, responding to the hospitality sector, and, and that's not just hospitality, but retail and entertainment as well. A uh, brand new event which we will see going forward. Uh, and also wanted to particularly um, single out the opera company. Um, so, you know, I don't think there is, well, there may be another opera company in the world somewhere which has been set up during the COVID environment. But to set one up, that is something quite special, and Don Giovanni was a fantastic event, and you see the numbers there were, were higher than was anticipated, so um, some pretty special things which have been uh, able to be achieved. Uh, I think that this, um, the sector has been incredibly resilient given the circumstances which they've had to, to work through. We have been absolutely essential to underpinning that resilience as well, uh, and I think we should uh, recognise that because the majority of major events have had some uh, some backing from the council and or Wellington NZ. Um, and look, the final thing I just wanted to say, um, because it was raised, um, Councillor Pannett, what a thing to say <laughs> about our beloved football team. Um, with her. With her, yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, look, we, we, do, we do have a relationship with all, we do have a relationship with all the major um, professional sports teams. Um, but if I could single out particularly the Phoenix, because it has been, can you think how tough it is to basically say you cannot play at home f essentially for two years. The whole lot of you have got to go with, with, with or without your families over to, um, to Australia and play from there in Wollongong. I have been in correspondence with the Mayor of Wollongong occasionally and said thank you for looking after them. <laughs> Developing relationships with the Wollongong community as, as best they possibly can. Um, and, and still producing you know, some good results. As I said, they won last night, which is good. Um, the weekend wasn't quite so good. Um, but if we were to pull the plug, now just think that the, the potential domino effect. So we don't, it's not just a men's team now, we've now got a women's team. We are looking forward next year to the FIFA, no sorry, the year after, 2023, to the FIFA Women's World Cup, which is, it's a bigger event, councillors, it's a bigger event than the Rugby World Cup in terms of the global reach of that. Huge for women's sport. Would we have that without the Phoenix? No. Would we have that in the country without the Phoenix? Possibly not. Uh, and then there's all the age grade, uh, all the age group um, competition there as well. So this is about the support and support for um, for a th what is the, the the global game? They are our only professional football team in this country. So you, you could nickel and dime it if you want to, but it would be a terrible message to send to our football community and I think to our sports community to go down that track. Uh, and the final thing to say is, of course, also the Phoenix have been really, really strong in reaching out to our, uh, our, our least privileged community, the refugee community in particular, and getting kids who otherwise wouldn't be able to play uh, and participate in sport, both to participate in sport and to games. So I'm really proud of us being part of supporting uh, the Phoenix, but also supporting all of the rest of our, um, our professional sports codes. And we stand alongside them because we're proud of them when they perform for us and we actually, I'm really keen that we actually do more and I have had these conversations with them but it's damn so easy to have conversations about trying to activate the city when you've actually got games in the city as opposed to Wollongong. Um, but you know that we actually do more to activate our city around games and so that Wellingtonians can all say oh, that's my team. 
whether it's rugby, whether it's football, whether it's cricket, whether it's netball, whether it's basketball, whatever, that's my team. I support them. I'm proud to be a Wellingtonian. And that's what our backing of these sports teams is all about. Yes. <laughs> um, just really quickly, just reading through that, that list of what we've funded through this fund is really heartwarming. Um, it is amazing to see the diversity that's gone out, but just um, really want to acknowledge Festival for the Future, that having this big event for our youth was quite mind-blowing, and I will say the Mayor did a great job of hosting the lunch that day. It was pretty impressive, but I really want to maintain that support for these organisations, but also just really acknowledging the Zero Car work as well through the um, Creative HQ, um, the uh Note which the accelerators there have really helped some of our business innovators like Mevo and No Car Cargo. So really keen to see that that keep going through there, um, and to acknowledge the support that our local artists needed over that time was amazing. But on that, I would like to say we need to keep fostering the next wow from a local group. So I'm really looking forward to see that coming through the support. But also I can say that as a retailer, that these events were massive and they really do make a difference to people coming in and on the ground and the, the vibrancy but so thanks it was great a great read thank you council Foon. councillor young uh, so just briefly really um thank you for all the work and the fantastic events that you um funded uh, on behalf of us all. Um, I would just like to point out that it does have a knock-on effect. Um, so the Welly Awards next year, February 24th, the arts sector, four of the finalists were directly involved in our major events. I know this because I'm one of the judges and it's also in the paper now. So Jerry Paul, Cuba Duper and um, Classical on Cuba. John Posatis, who did the sonic whatever up and down Cuba Street with all those, what was it, 200 or orchestral groups? Uh, Matthew Ross, Wellington Opera. Yes, I'm sure it is the only new opera company in the world, and they're doing another performance on well, next year. Um, and it's Mozart. And I can't, is it? No, it's not. Is it La Traviata? I think it's there. Yes. Anyway, La Traviata. And then finally, Sam Truebridge. What if Wellington was a theatre? So there are four of the five nominations for the Welly Arts Sector, uh, and it gives great profile to them, to their organisations, and to what you do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other? Oh, look, and I don't need to write a reply other than to say thank you for the lovely comments, both of you. <laughs> right, cool, right. Okay, uh, next paper, we're rocking on now, oral submissions process. Stephen, after... Stephen, after the conversation we've had earlier, any need to say anything else? Uh, no, I think we can just answer questions, but probably just to say that um, <clears throat> the, the reason for putting this in front of the council was obviously the very heavy workload next year. Yep. So it was a way of managing it. Okay, councillors, we've got the names plugged in to there. Everybody check you're in the right one, yep. Any questions, councillors? Yeah, the date and the dates will... Yep. One question, Councillor O'Neill. My question was... Cou oh. Sorry, Councillor O'Neill, question. My question was, Councillor Paul is online and was not able to join us during the adjournment. I'm just wondering if they have been chatted to? She's not online at the moment. Or was online, yeah. Does Councillor Paul know this is where they've ended up? Okay. <laughs> That's a bit challenging. I, I, I think I think Councillor Paul actually did want to be in the traffic one as well. So um, unless somebody wants to come off the traffic one, um, then I think we have to land where we are. Right. She can always go along. She's not 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 a problem there. She can go along. Okay. Right. Okay, councillors. I don't need to move. Uh, do anything more than move it. Seconded by Councillor Day. Yes. Thank you. Any debate? I see none. Let's vote. You know, we're, we're, we're rocking and rolling now. So, right, done? Right, okay. Paper Road. 
Um, Sean, is there anything you want to say? We've, we've, you've told us that you've had the conversations, so anything you want to highlight? Right, That's councillors? That's I really wanted to talk about, yeah, so. Councillors, are there any questions of Siobhan? Councillor, any questions of Siobhan? I see none. Right, so that is going to be moved by Councillor Wolf. Oh, Councillor Councillor O'Neill. Okay, Councillor O'Neill, do you wish to say anything? I'll just briefly bring up my notes. Sorry, I promise it will be quick. Councillor Wolf, are you staying, going? What are you doing here? No, I've got cramp. You've got cramp. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Um, Councillor. Thank you, Councillors. I'm sorry. Not right. Like that. Happy to move this paper, um, and I just wanted to. St <laughs> um, I just wanted to start by thanking officers, um, in particular John, Siobhan and Liam, uh, for responding to some of the issues that uh, Liz Kelly raised with us last week at the Regulatory Committee. Um, it was my pleasure to be chairing at the time and um, I just wanted to reflect that this is why we have some of our awesome mana whenua reps um, sitting at the table and how valuable that insight is because Liz was able to pull this up and uh, as detailed out in emails, um, we're really privileged as a council to be able to engage with Ngāti Toa within the space of a week to receive feedback on the proposal, and in this case, um, they're pretty happy with the paper. Um, and just to note as well that um, we have apologised to Ngāti Toa for failing to engage on the proposal initially, but um, signalling um, that with the good work of, of Liz Kelly that other things will be changing around the table and we'll be more proactive in the future. Um, and I'd like to welcome Councillor Wolfe to second. Do you say anything? No. Okay, anybody? Oh, Councillor Day. Uh, yeah, oh, just wanted to say um, that um, I was um, encouraged um, with the discussions on Friday with iwi reps around how to deal with this, because this is um, one of the hard parts of the way our legislation works and how we're required to engage, and it's about um, us saying we've made a commitment to engage with mana whenua, and um, I thank you, um, Barbara, for your um, support of looking at these processes, and iwi were really keen to... Um, Make sure that we are we are thinking thinking more broadly when we're talking about Fenua, and that we are engaging at every step of the way. So I think there's a really good way forward. Um, it does show the value of having um, our mana Fenua seats because um, potentially we wouldn't have necessarily been aware of that without that. So it's good to see it it playing out in in real life, but also um, want to acknowledge the staff for the amazing work they've done to continue to build those relationships. And it's really not a particular um, fault of anyone on, on, in this process. It's more just that you know we've, we've, we're challenging the way that we work and the way that we think, and it means sometimes we're going to find little gaps in it. And um, I think the good thing is the intention is to move forward and think about how we communicate when we've got these exchanges of land happening. So, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Councillor Day. Um, Councillor Matthews. Just wanted to briefly share that I've been texting with Liz this morning and she uh, has given her apologies. She wanted to be here for this discussion and join us for lunch. And she said to say, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to you all. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice indeed. Okay. Uh, uh, any council officer right? question? Uh, oh, well, the, I did, the I've already done have... questions, so you can... You can uh, yes, yes. Um, so, Councillor, um, if you want to ask the question that uh, Councillor O'Neill can deal with and write a reply, I hope. Well, if you could just outline what the United Toa are concerned and the interest in the whenua and, and how that came about and the resolution, that would be helpful. Yeah, don't worry. That, that maybe if, if you can, Terry, that's good, but if you can't, then it might be offline. Yeah, OK. Right, right of reply. Is there anything you want to reply to? Just to respond to Councillor Rush's point, I don't think it's appropriate that I speak on behalf of the iwi, but we can have that quoted or offline. Yep. Okay, Council, councillors, let's take it. No, let's not have the cross, cross the table. Right. Okay, councillors, let's vote. Right, done. Okay, right. It's still going well. Now, this one, I'm, I'm not sure about this one, but never mind, we'll see whether this one's as quick. Right, uh, three waters of reform. Um, Siobhan, welcome back. Is there anything you want to say uh, or anything? Yeah, so I'll just introduce paper because yeah. this is okay. um, something that may not be familiar um, in terms of the subject matter. So this is 
Um, MB put out a discussion paper on economic regulation in relation to three water reform. So proposing some form of economic re um, regulation when the reform process is completed and these en entities are set up. So the basic premise of economic regulation is it helps protect the consumer in a monopoly. So it comes in a number of forms, but this one is really focused on information disclosure and regulating price and quality of services. So it is used extensively in the telco and power sector in New Zealand um, and also overseas in the water sector. Um, in terms of our submission, so I think the point to make here that it was a discussion document at a policy level, so it is quite high level. There's lots of detail that is yet to be worked through. Um, our position is that um, this is a joint submission. So there are nine councils who've um, contributed to this submission. Um, it has been put together with the help of um, Dougal List, who came and presented last week, um, as well as Concept Consulting, who's had lots of experience in this area. Um, so um, our main uh, feedback to this is that there seems to be a bit of a dislocation between MB and DIA. It doesn't come through very strongly in terms of the connection, in terms of um, the reform process. So we encourage that connection to be made. Um, we uh, would like the consumer groups to be better defined um, because that will really um, speak to the level of service that we're expecting to be delivered to different consumer ca um, categories. Uh, we encourage them to consider broader social outcomes. So they need to be aware of these and balance efficiency, social outcomes and cultural outcomes as well. Um, and we did question whether the Commerce Commission is equipped to deal with this type of regulation in terms of the size. Um, the water sector is significantly bigger than the electricity sector. It would be the biggest sector that would be regulated in New Zealand today. Um, so really thinking about whether there need to be a separate agency set up to do this. Um, and the culture of the regulator as well. Um, some concern of how long it would take to bed this in and the need for the regulator to work alongside those entities to make sure that those improvements could be made over time. Councillors, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask how many people have got questions on this one? Okay, that might not take us too long. The, the reason I was going to ask that is there were lots of questions I was going to say, let's go for lunch. If there are only a couple, then let, I, I'm going to take the punt. Do we think we're going to get through the other papers as well quickly? Okay, well, let's give it a go. Okay, right, Councillor, Councillor Foon first. Councillor Foon, questions? Question. Yeah, I, I just, so, um, so, so, so two Council questions. Councillor Foon, st standing, please. Sorry. Yeah. It's a bit awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Good <laughs> rock star thing. You're a rock star. Nine, nine councils, so how do we make a change if we wanted to? Oh, so you can. So the submissions, um, we need to get them ready for, they need to be by the 20th, so we've... Um, we've said we'd give feedback by the 17th. So you can make a change and, yeah, so it can be added to it. Okay, and so we need to do it through this process though? Yeah. Yep. Um, next would be around just, I didn't see a lot of, I know that this is an economic view, but the, the understanding that what we're all trying to get to is lower water use and incentivising non-use, and I mm. didn't really see that coming through as part of the narrative. Mm. So, I mean, that would be a byproduct of regulation in terms of driving efficiency. So the purpose of regulation is to drive efficiency in monopolies. So if you have a monopoly which has no controls over it, it's not incentivised to use its product efficiently or deliver that product efficiently. So that's kind of the purpose of having an economic regulation lens on top of mm. um, looking over the shoulder of a monopoly, um, essentially. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yep. That's probably more what I'm looking for in it. Yep. Um, yeah. Just really where this ends up. So I'm um, obviously going back to um, government agencies, but um, will this be something that's likely could be considered by the um, water reform um, working party, which is made up of councils. Is this sort of where we feed this into at all? So there are a number of working groups being oh, right. set up. So there's one that's looking at the governance. Um, yeah. 
and there's actually a working group which is at the officer level as well which is the regional working yeah. group as well so this is that's the group that's put this submission together essentially that's being made on behalf of all of the councils in the region um, in terms of the go this is all this goes hand in glove with the reform process um, but this is our chance to really submit into this at this point before they um, look at legislation. So is this something we could formally copy into the w the governance water reform working party? Well, they'll all be across that, yes. They'll be across that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Rush, then Panet. Very briefly, so you mentioned this discussion document, you mentioned legislation's coming, so there'll be a select committee process where we can uh, make further representations mm -hmm. that when we've narrowed down the sort of things that we're looking at. Yep, the timing of that in the original discussion right. paper was around yes. in March. We just, we'd anticipate that would be pushed okay, out by about yep. three months, given that the yep. legislation on the water reform okay. has been deferred. Right. Okay, I'm going to take one more question from... Oh, Councillor Rush, you done? I'm oh, done. No, okay, Councillor Panett, because we, we, have some, um, we have some lunch downstairs. We also have a special surprise. <laughs> I don't know. Another cycle <laughs> way? Right, Councillor Panett. Councillor Panett. <laughs> um, Siobhan, thanks, thanks to you and the team for all the work that you've done into this, and I, I think you've tried to be really thoughtful, so that's appreciated. Um, the ability to pay is one particular area where I'm really concerned. I'm just wondering if we can strengthen that a little bit, you know? Like, if are, are we going to be sending around the debt collectors to people on low incomes that can't afford to pay? You know, like, just given it's a completely different funding regime. Um, so I think if you look to the electricity sector for guidance here where they've done a lot of work in the area of energy poverty and put controls specifically around that. Um, so by all means we can put something additional in the submission. Mm -hmm. Okay, councillors, um, we'll, we'll stop the... Um, the questions that I've got a couple, but I'm going just in terms of time. I'm going to suggest we adjourn now till half past one, uh, and we'll go down. We'll, we'll have a, a lunch break, um, and uh, we will resume at half past one.
So are we ready to go again? Yep. Okay, right. Here's where I think I'm standing up. I might, I might, uh, <laughs> I'll take them off at this point. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Is there any other? Qu so we've done all the uh, questions, you haven't we? Question, I believe. No, no. Um, my questions are, my questions are now downstairs. So we're going to deal with that. Yeah. Right. No okay. Right. Yeah. Councillors, are there any other questions on the three waters paper? No. Otherwise, we'll. Okay, we'll get started again. So, no other questions on the three waters paper. Councillor Rush, do you want to um, introduce the paper? Yeah, very quickly, uh, folks. So, um, a lot of reform going on. Um, I think the idea of a economic regulator is broadly accepted. Um, how, how that's going to be structured is still need to be finessed. Um, we are at discussion document stage, and that's why this submission is, is quite broad. I'd like us to be a little bit more refined. I'd like to see some examples from other jurisdictions on how this is how this works in, in their um, areas. I would like us to um, define the scope of what the regulator does, but uh, for now I think there's quite a lot of points that are made in a very general sense that should give uh, the, um, the powers that be some good information uh, to be able to, to put to the wise heads together and, and go to the next phase. So I'm happy to move this paper. Thanks, Councillor Rush. Councillor Condi. Thank you. I just want to... Um draw your attention to a few things that were mentioned in the in the submission that came out of the task force report, so I was really pleased to see them in the submission. One was a focus on um, renters versus landlords and how we consider how that's going to work for um, charging models going forward, because that can actually be quite a different thing. Um, obviously, the task force had a, um, a strong recommendation in there about vulnerable consumers and the, the issues and concerns that we had around, you know, deprivation and affordability for those things. So it was really good to see that coming through um, and acknowledge that Councillor Panitz asked for that to be strengthened. I wonder whether maybe a reference to the task force recommendations might be a way to do that as well, that that was something that the task force was unanimously wanted to see more work done on as well. And also just good to see that there, the conversations in there about depreciation and how depreciation funding is going to be handled because we, the last thing we want is for the reforms to happen and for those same um, things to fall through the cracks. So it was good that there was lots of things in the, in the submission when I was reading it that picked up on things that had come out of the task force, which is exactly what we want to see. So thank you for the work that was done there. Anyone else? Look, can I just, just say something? I actually, in reading the, the, um, uh, the submission, I actually I was really impressed by it. Uh, I thought there was a lot of depth in it, and I, I thought that was that was really good. I think the um, the interesting thing, one of the a number of, I've already covered off one thing, which was how can you regulate your say you regulate your way to um, to efficiency. So Siobhan assures me that it's been done in the um, in the electricity industry. So I'll look forward to see how this uh, this pans out. But I think it's it's interesting that the submission also calls uh, calls to attention that there are a lot of uh, issues around the interface between um, these water the proposed water entities and everything else that's going on around them, particularly things like land use and planning. Um, you know, and it'll be parks, land, all those kind of things. And I know the regional council, for example, is going to be particularly exercised around the place of the land, the, the catchments, etc. Um, but there's, there's that general question about the interface between water service entities and everything else that's going on around them. And I'm not sure that in the reforms that the um, you know the reforms are predicated on these massive efficiency gains which are expected from scale. And I am sceptical of the numbers in the first place, but I'm also sceptical of the fact that there are going to be, I think there are going to be some significant inefficiencies in some of the interfaces. At the moment, there's an interface directly, you know, um, that while we've got smaller entities, the interface is directly with councils which own them, but I think there'll be some significant inefficiencies in the, in the system uh, as it's being set up. But it'll be really, really interesting to see, but I think it's a really good submission. It's really good that it calls some of these things to attention, uh, and I think the point you made about the interface between different parts of government, DIA and MB, I think it's an important one as well. So I think a great submission, and uh, Siobhan, uh, congratulations to you and everybody else who's been part of putting it together. Anyone else? Don't see anyone. Right reply, Councillor Rush. No, right reply, thank you. <coughs> That, that boogie board's obviously a worry. Right, okay. 
Uh, actions tracking. Um, Stephen. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'll just take it as read. Okay, <laughs> Councillors, are there any are there any questions of um, of Stephen on the action tracking? I see none. Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you like to move? Uh, I'll move. Thank you. Seconded by uh, Councillor Young. Thank you. I'll, any debate? I'll put it. Okay, so Councillor Panett is now not there. Right, okay. Right, full programme. Again, in, nothing to... Re just to just say. to really say that, um, you know, by the time we get to um, March, for example, there could be other things added, but at this stage, uh, those are the two known items on February uh, 24th and 24 March. I will move. Councillor Councillor Condy seconded. Right. Any debate? No. <laughs> right. Let's vote. Thank you. Right. That takes us to committee reports. Uh, so we've got the report of the grants committee, which is um, it's Mark there. There he is. Right, Mark. Do you want to uh, come? Oh, I think I think you're you're allowed to come to the table. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so you're part of our wider bubble. Yes, I think that's the way it works. Right. So, Mark, is there anything you want to say? You are. I think you are allowed to unmask as well. It's my understanding. Right. Anything you want to say to uh, regarding the paper? Uh, Councillor Panett has suggested one small amendment to the criteria in attachment one to the paper. And I could speak to that, if that would be useful. Mark, if you'd like to speak to it, because yes. I guess the question is whether that can be... I'm not sure whether it can be included in the substantive, given it's a recommendation from Grants Committee, so it might need to be amended too. Yeah, you, you, yeah, okay, right, Mark, if you can I speak to that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, so if you want to speak yes. to that, Mark, yes. please. Um, it's, a, it's a small um, amendment which has the intention of drawing application, applicants' attention to the requirements of the Building Act for uh, both accessibility and I think will also have the effect of drawing applicants' attention to the Building Act requirements for earthquake strengthening of um, heritage buildings. And the wording is, if I may read it, um, for criteria two for the uh, proposed heritage resilience and regeneration fund, the planned work must aim to physically improve the building's structural integrity and conserve and or enhance the building's heritage values, ongoing sustainability and accessibility. And the addition from Councillor Panett is noting that owners must also meet the requirements under the Building Act. So that's the, un that's the only bit that Councillor Panett's raised. Well, yes. I would have thought that stands to reason, doesn't it? Yes. So you are, you are perfectly comfortable? Right. I am comfortable. So, so um, Councillor, yeah. Councillor Fitzsimons? Is, uh, well, sorry, first of all, are there any questions of... of uh, Mr. Lindsay. I see none. So, Councillor Fitzsimons, thanks, well, Mark. Just very briefly, I'm sure you've all read the paper. Really, this is just about a more targeted approach. It's aimed at where the contribution can make the most difference, uh, and particularly where heritage building owners are struggling to meet the cost. So, there will also be a much more active approach to owners than has previously been the case. Thank you. Uh, seconded by Councillor O'Neill. Thank you. Do you wish to speak? Okay, anybody else wish to speak? Right, okay, let's vote then.
Councillor Rush. Thank you. Done. Okay, thank you. Uh, that takes us to um, item 4.2, which is the report of the Regulatory Processes Committee meeting. I was the road stopping there. Um, Councillor O'Neill was chairing at the time. Um, is there any need for any questions on this one? Because otherwise we won't worry about officers. Okay, there were, okay. do you wish to move? Yes. Thank you. Seconded, Councillor Wolfe. Thank you. Uh, is there any other people wish to speak? I see nobody. Okay, let's vote then. Uh, right of approach. Uh, Carried, thank you. Okay, report 4.3, the infrastructure committee meeting. Minor change to the bylaw. Uh, does anybody have any questions of this one? Don't see anyone have question. Oh, so is that a question there, Councillor Foon? Yes, I just wondered, I thought I saw waste bylaw, but it was actually water bylaw. Or what, have I, am I just dreaming? Water, water, it's water. Right, yeah, okay, so that's the only question then? So it's just typos or reading, right, okay, so yes, you double vision, one of those, okay. Right, so uh, Councillor Rush, do you wish to move? <laughs> do you wish to Sure, I'm um, happy to move, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Condi, do you want a second? Yeah, Councillor Condi, second, any debate? I can see the, the desire to vote, so let's do that. Okay. So Jill, did you mean to vote against that? <laughs> okay, I, I think we'll correct that one. Right. <laughs> No, no, I think you're gonna to need to move that. Move it, yep. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, you, yeah, yeah, he just got it, yeah, yeah. Okay, right, okay, councillors, councillors. You were going so well, councillor day. <laughs> okay, councillors, that takes us to item five, which is uh, the motion to move into public excluded. So I'm gonna move that. Uh, the two, councillor Young, the two, the two, the, the two bits here, the two, the two things in front of us, one is appointments to council controlled organisations, the reasons about protecting privacy of natural persons, and then update on parking activity. Uh, this is because the uh, uh, allows us to co conduct commercial negotiations and uh, protect the public in that way. I'm gonna move, uh, seconded by Counts, uh, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, any debate? Okay, let's, let's vote then. Uni here, uni here, it is Uru Tapanui. Kiwatia, Kiamama, Tanakio, Tatinana, Tewairua. It is Ara Takatu. Kwea ra erongo, Fakaria, Akikironga, Kiwatia, Kiwatia, Aira, Kuwati. And that concludes the final meeting for the year. Uh, can I just say again, councillors, thank you very much. Officers, thank you very much. And can I especially say,